What's up, guys? Thanks for doing this. Um, just introduce both of you to the audience, Leif Strom, Aroth Rose, Austin Roark. Um, you guys have both been coaches with us for a while. Both have thrown mid-90s, upper 90s, um, you know, lengthy pro career, amateur pro career. Um, so I wanted to get on this podcast and discuss arm action because we've done these podcasts for, you know, lower half, um, for other different topics, but arm action is such a, a big and kind of misunderstood topic. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of pieces to kind of discuss. And I know both of you specifically have spent a lot of time going down these rabbit holes, both in your own career and then also with the athletes that you've worked with. So first off, thanks for being on the podcast. And I just want to give a disclaimer just off the bat before we get into it. We're going to be going down some rabbit holes. We're going to be talking about big picture theory. We're going to be talking about specific flaws and giving suggestions for what we've seen work to help cure some of these different flaws. Uh, most of this, I can almost guarantee actually, everything in this podcast will not apply to you if you're watching this video. There might be one or two specific things that apply to your specific case. So if you're an athlete, especially in season right now, don't get domed up and think that you need to go and try and apply every single thing in this podcast. This is an informational podcast talking about the theory and it's kind of more so for coaches, but on the athlete standpoint, as we go through some of these single flaws, there might be one or two things you can glean from this podcast. So that's how I would approach this is learning some background, learning some context, but hey, what's the one or two things I can take away that would apply to my specific situation, some of the issues I have going on, and how can I better understand how my delivery is working? As opposed to taking this and trying to completely overhaul everything, you know, suddenly you're doing 10 new drills, suddenly you're completely changing everything in season. So I just wanna get that out of the way first, and you know, to go along with that, also realizing like some guys don't need to actively work on their arm action to improve their arm action. Their arm action will clean up if you fix the first move, you fix their posture, you fix their pelvis and their lower half and head a load from their, their backside and the arm action naturally slots in and cleans up. So I also don't want this to come across as you have to now just go do a bunch of arm action drills and your focus when you're throwing is only on the arm action. But for the sake of this, we do want to definitely dive into some of these rabbit holes. So you guys want to add anything to that disclaimer before we dive in? I think I'm good on that. Yeah, good on that. Just the uh, don't get domed up in season about arm action is probably the last yeah. place you want to think. Hundred percent. I, I just feel like we have to mention it just yeah, because sure. you never yeah. know who's watching it. You might, there might be some 15 year old kid who doesn't understand some of the context, and suddenly he's just all over the place. Yeah, um, I certainly sure. was that way when, yeah. before I knew what I know now. I'm sure you, we both have tendencies of just like trying whatever you see online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first thing I want to just kind of discuss big picture purpose of the arm action. Like if we zoom out, we look at the, the overall delivery, we look at what an efficient delivery entails from the lower half to how that energy is transferred to like, where does the arm action slot into that overall kinematic sequence, that overall process of the delivery? Can I go first? Yeah, you can go first. Okay. Um, yeah, so for me, it's like the last piece. Um, and I know a lot of people in general, you know, what's the first thing you notice about a pitcher? when you're first starting, when you don't know much about mechanics is you see how fast his arm's moving and it just looks like a blur, right? And that's like, that's kind of like dream when you're younger is to have that just quick, fast, whippy arm. Um, and you see these guys that you're like, oh, he's born with that or, you know, it's just, he has that naturally. But then as you progress through your career, you start to realize there's all these common traits among these quick arms, quote unquote, where it's, you know, more than just this guy was born with maybe super, you know, good fascial linings, whatever it is. Um, it's more than that. It's the positions you put yourself in leading up to the arm action that then puts you in a position to let the arm work through. And that's like what we were saying before, where it's more than just the patterns that you get your arms into, say in a 10 toes, a pivot pick, whatever, you know, an upper half constraint is gonna be. It's gonna be the flow up to the arm and how good you are at capturing energy into what's going to eventually be ball release. And I think another way of saying that is it's how well you can learn to use your body and arm as a whip. Yeah. And so part of the way that I think about it is you're trying to organize your, your body in this ideal kinematic sequence where it's your, your transfer energy from the ground up. And really you could think of it from like center of the body out. So proximate to distally, but from the pelvis up through the torso, ultimately turning your arm into a whip. So it's how well, how smoothly, how efficiently can I accelerate and decelerate and turn my arm into a whip where I'm efficiently transferring that energy through my body. And so the arm action is just a conduit for transferring that energy from the pelvis, from the torso, and ultimately the arm action needs to be able to get you into positions to allow that ball to get into the same plane of rotation. So you can imagine different, different quote unquote arm action flaws. If the arm is super low and dragging, 
now when you go to rotate, that ball, which we want to get into the plane of rotation, right? if this is the plane of rotation of our shoulders, we want that ball to ultimately be able to get in that same plane or as close to it as possible to maximize the efficiency of energy transfer. So the arms dragging down here, or your elbows climbing way up here, or you're way outside here, all of these are different, or you're you know, super inside 90 degrees and you're pushing the ball, all these are different ways that you're not turning your arm into a whip and getting that ball to maximize, to be, be in the same plane of rotation. It's, it's almost like you're creating this, this linear momentum, you're converting into this tornado of energy up the chain, and you wanna ma maximize the ability to get that ball out and around into that tornado. So how well can we turn our arm into a whip? Yeah, and just to, just to build off that, just like I agree with both of you, what you're saying is like a lot of people will see arm action like it's the first thing, you know, people talk about just in scouting reports like, oh, he has a fast arm or a whippy arm, just building off that. The way that I kind of visualize it is like the arm actions role and like what we're trying to do is basically just not get it involved too early. We just want it to be in the right spot at the right time. So when all these pieces, lower half, torso work how they should, the arm action is just trying to sink in and capture all that rotational momentum from the lower half up and the arm's just gonna slot in kind of where it needs to be. And that's kind of how I visualize it, but just like letting this be the last thing of the chain that actually ends up going, get to the right spot at the right time. So when the, all of this works, it can just capture all that momentum and be able to get sent in a ball release. It's funny because there was kind of this, this idea that maybe, maybe less so now, um, but this idea 10, 15 years ago, I don't even remember um, some of the set pro stuff, but it's the, you know, the arm throws the ball. And so we need to organize everything around the arm throwing the ball, arm action, efficient arm action, and almost like nothing else really matters. And part of the logic there was, okay, we can throw about 80% of our top velo from the arm. Yeah. If you just put yourself on two knees and you throw, or you completely just like avoid any sort of hip rotation from a 10 toes drill and throw, you do a snap throw, you can throw about 80%, give or take, depending on the guy, of your top end velo. Therefore, everything that matters is the arm action. Therefore, we should just work on maximizing the efficiency of the arm action. The problem is what you realize is that you end up bypassing all that other 20%, which actually tends to matter quite a bit. So to your point, it's in a lot of cases, just about letting, getting the arm out of the way, yep. not letting the arm come into the throw too soon and take over the throw. It's like, how long can we delay bringing the arm into the throw and actually maximize the 20% that we're getting from our stride, from hip rotation and from that action right there. Now we know we have the 80% left over. But if we just have a crappy lower half, fall down the mound, open up early, like we have our 80%, we have, there's our 80 miles an hour. Yeah. Those are 84, 89 miles an hour. But to that point, like what, what, what really matters between the difference between a D1 guy, a 89 mile an hour guy and a 96 mile an hour guy? Like it's maximizing everything from every other piece of the chain too. So that was almost, that was a kind of a misconception that I had when I first started out was hearing, okay, you can throw 80% from your two knees just do arm action stuff. Yeah. Arm action is the most important thing when actually it's like, no, the 80% is gonna be there. In a lot of cases, it's lower halves type stuff. It doesn't mean we, there can't be arm action fixes as well, but that's something that I kind of ran into myself. I don't know if you guys ever had that uh, misconception too. Yeah, no, I absolutely did. I mean, I spent a lot of time just kind of like grilling out just like straight up separation drills with just trying to like get the arm to do a lot of the work and like really and to your point going back is like this could be the difference from an indie ball guy who is 88 91 you know maybe he has a solid arm action or like the arm gets into relatively decent positions but it's like if we're not actually funneling energy up and actually getting the arm to sink into it you know that could be his 92 94 topping 95 and that's a completely different ball player in terms of just like stuff you know, off speed stuff gets better, pitch metrics get better, and then just velocity in general gets better. It's like, if you just go and hammer arm action all day, every day, not to say that someone out there doesn't need that, but you're probably gonna end up running into a plateau at some point where you're like, okay, like arm action isn't the only thing I should be focused on. I need to do something else to actually say funnel up energy from the lower half into the upper right. half. Right, yeah, you need to be able to zoom out and take like a big picture yeah. of, even if, even if there is a month period where all we're doing is like arm action type stuff, it's, there still needs to be a plan for how am I gonna blend this to the rest of the delivery? Yeah. Because I remember around that time, I think I was 15, 15 or 16, I can, again, I bought into that. I, all I was doing was arm action stuff and I was, you know, I was under the impression that, hey, I'm not allowed to move on to adding in torso rotation or adding in the hips until I've like perfected my arm action. And so I was in my backyard just doing like snap throws mm -hmm. here and I was, you know, I was a skinny kid snap throwing like 75 from here, like super whippy. Like I was in good positions. Yeah. I'd get on the mound, no idea what I was doing, just f falling open yeah. and it'd be 75, like it'd be 73, 75. I wouldn't gain any velocity from adding in the lower half. So I had no idea how to actually bridge that. And I was almost getting too myopic, too focused on the arm action as opposed to being able to see the bigger picture. And it wasn't until for me when I got to college personally, 
and I started to figure out the lower half, I started to figure out how to create tension in the backside, that everything else kind of slotted into place once I figured out the lower half. But just having no idea what I was doing in my lower half and just doing arm action drills all day, to me that wasn't enough. But then you have guys like, you hear the Craig Kimbrell story where, I don't know if he broke his ankle or something, yeah. mm -hmm. and he already had a good lower half, he's throwing upper 80s, bad upper half, and so for him, two knee long toss, and like now suddenly maximizing that, he gets healthy, he reincorporates everything, because he already knew how to use his lower half. It's like, boom, now he's throwing upper 90s. Now he's throwing 100 miles an hour. And so I don't think there's one right answer, right. but certainly not getting overly myopic and just looking at the arm action as this like isolated piece. It's how does that work as part of the whole? How does it sink into the entire delivery? Yeah. So I have a kind of a, a theory or frame of reference of how like I just kind of envision the arm action. And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but I want to hear like if you guys have specific ways you just like visualize or uh, kind of conceptualize the arm action yourself. But one of the ways that I've thought about it is as an infinity sign or like a like a horizontal eight. So imagine you're basically thinking about like creating a loop with your arm action or a spiral. We've heard this arm action like spiral type terminology thrown around. But envision like Aroldis Chapman's arm action. Envision what's going on with the throwing arm and the the backswing there. You can almost envision that as like tracing the bottom of that infinity sign with the throwing arm. You look at what's happening with the glove arm, it's almost like he's tracing the top of that infinity sign. So he's opening the loop. Although in this, in this case, there's some tension on the glove side. He's opening the loop, then flip up happens and he's closing the loop. So he's kind of almost like tracing an, an infinity sign. What I like about that idea is that it gives you, it gives you a conception of how both sides are working together. You're opening the loop and then you're closing the loop. When you just give guys like a glove arm cue, they start to think of their glove arm as like this isolated piece, or you just give them like a, a throwing arm cue, they start to think of that in isolation and right. like forget about the glove arm. But that's like a cue or a way of conceptualizing it that like it's no, it's how, does, how do these two things work together to open the loop, close the loop. You get to that open position, you've created like loose, free, scap retraction, arms up on time, then you accelerate, you close the loop. So I guess first, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you have a different way of thinking about it? There's, again, there's not one right answer, but that's one way I've helped, uh, found to be useful in explaining to my guys. Yeah, I think that for me, it was always a misconception of how I thought I was throwing hard. And I was always a big arm guy as well. Like I would do the two knee long toss. I would, I would feel my arm go. And um, in general, like just throughout Little League and stuff, taught, you know, V to the sky was like the big saying when I was, you know, nine, 10, 11 years old. And, for me, that gave me a feeling of like massive stretch. It felt like my arm was whipping through or what like I conceptualized at the time as whipping through when in reality, my arm was dragging like crazy because I was so long and whipping through. But on those days where my arm would, you know, get those tingles, I'd feel tight through the arm. I'd be like, I'm really ripping today because I was just so long through. And so, you know, for me going forward, something that maybe I don't apply as much now, but when I was younger, um, introducing like some type of constraint, we use like the Walmart, um, you know, big bouncy ball things. But now a lot of guys use tap, the tap balls um, that are about this big and like actually realizing that, okay, like this thing works in like this circle around that ball. And that started helping me realize, okay, like this thing's actually a whip through. And then the feeling difference between, you know, starting with that Vita sky and ripping through versus letting that arm unwind forward was just huge for me. And I remember the unlock being that I had my arm not feel stretched and like tingly and it was two miles an hour harder. And I just, I, and you I were likely just that. ripping on your radial or ulnar nerve the whole time as exactly. a result of just like exactly. taking out all the slack from your nerve and ripping through. Yeah. And then that nerve chain. Also it's like when you start here and then you go and you're, you know, the biceps contracting, very quickly it's just a lot of systems are being asked to do way too much um, and that's what you're feeling when you feel you know at those times where i was like oh, i'm throwing hard today because my arm feels arguably bad which that's not the case do you have another take on that yeah i mean i guess my take on arm action it's a little bit different i guess the more i've the harder i've thrown as like i've gotten older and learned a lot more about myself it's like when i was younger i was that guy that was internalizing every small thing of like my i was looking at the to the degree of like the arm studies show that the arms need to be here 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 like following a lot of the jargon that you would hear on social media of like oh i need to try and chase this perfect visually looking arm action and then really just neglected every other part of my body and i really didn't understand the concept of 
of like energy funneling up and trying to just let the arm be relaxed at the right time. I was very, you know, starting here, being very aggressive, like trying to get, you know, the perfect, like to the degree of where I needed to be in the flip up. And so I've internalized it a ton. As I've gotten older and the harder that I've thrown, I've completely gone away from really even worrying about exactly where this is and more so on the external focus of just like, hey, looking at like from a mocap standpoint and just sequencing in general, like what is happening in like a high velocity delivery. And it's like, you know, seeing how the pelvis works and peaks at the right time, the torso is in the right spot, then the torso can peak. It's like, I've taken that approach. And so my thoughts on the arm action have gone a lot simplified in terms of like, hey, I just need to keep this very relaxed. I just need to let it actually flow up, get to the right position at the right time. Still need some work, of course, if we've seen me throw, it's not the prettiest, but um, I definitely feel like the actual sequence of throw has gotten a lot better. And this kind of goes into like how I conceptualize the arm for me is kind of that gears analogy that I mentioned to you guys the other day where it's like, I see the delivery as like, and this is a very simplified version. There's other pieces of course going on, but it's just an easy reference for, for me and what I'm trying to do with this is like, I see, you know, the whole delivery in the arm action is just trying to slot into that of like the pelvis going down the mountain is the first gear of rotation. Like the pelvis, it needs to be able to drive rotation. Okay, the gear starts with pelvis turning. Correct. That's, gear, that's the first part. Like this is the first part. So like everything from leg lift down, I'm just trying to set up that first gear to be able to peak it right before front foot and get to the right spot. And then I'm trying to keep this gear relaxed and patient. And then if I do that gear right, this one's probably gonna be in a good spot to then now this gear, the torso is gonna go. And a lot of people like, for me, example, I've spent years with, I think these two gears have been pretty decent where it's like pelvis and torso do a decent job at just like sequencing, getting that to go. But the third gear being the arm action is just always, just has never synced into what I've been trying to do. Cause I'm very like tight, tense and just go in and want to rip. But I've gone up to, and it got me up to the 90, 91 mark, but it was like max effort, didn't know where it was going. It was very aggressive with the hips and torso, but the arm just wasn't able to slot in and sink into that plane of rotation with kind of what you mentioned. So for me, it's like, okay, I need to spend some time on the third gear, which for me is, is my arm action. So getting this kind of do what it needs to, done that well, torso, I feel like it's in a pretty good spot. And these kind of two work together in a way, but now learning how to actually let all of this work to then let the arm just be patient and let that third gear come through. That's where I've gotten the, the 94, eight walking windup, or it's come out a lot easier. Now I can kind of like just relax and just flick 90, 91 instead of a max effort, 90, 91. And to your point with the, with the gear analogy, it's not just like labeling like pelvis, torso, arm, it's actually, you're trying to create like a lag between the two right. that allows one to accelerate and the next, to, then decelerate the next to go, decelerate the next to right. go. And so if you actually look at like a motion capture graph, a kinematic sequence, then you actually see that you see Decel. these peaks happen. Yeah. You see pelvis, then torso, and, and a high level thrower. Absolutely. You, you won't see it. If there's an issue, you might see pelvis and torso peak together. Right. And that's the guy where the pelvis and the torso are rotating together as opposed to pelvis goes, there's a lag, then the torso goes, there's a lag, the arm is left behind, then the arm goes. And so you wanna see this peak, this sequential pattern where it's pelvis, torso, yep. then it's elbow extension, and then it's shoulder internal rotation. Right. Elbow extension, shoulder internal rotation. So what, what does that sequence des describe? Well, that describes a whip. That's exactly like how a whip-like phenomenon works. It's just larger segments to smaller segments. And that energy, like you said, is funneling up, up the chain. Larger segments, pelvis, torso. So one gear, two gears, three gears, four gears, and it's just going to progressively smaller and smaller segments, higher and higher velocities, ultimately out into a five ounce ball. In which to get back to your point of like the arm action, you know, going back to the arm action theory is like, what is the role in the arm action in that sequence? In my opinion, it's just like, don't let it get too involved too early. If we're seeing the high velocity throwers have that sequence yeah. of pelvis. Wait until the pelvis and the torso have done their thing. They need to work. And at that point when the pelvis and the torso have done their thing, you and wanna make sure the arm is in a position to actually slot into the plane of rotation. Exactly. What, what is that position? And that position is roughly speaking, somewhere around 90 degrees of shoulder yeah, abduction. give and take. So not down here and not way up here, somewhere give or take. It's somewhere give or take 10, 15 degrees of elbow flexion. So not out here and not way in here. And it's somewhere around vertical, 45 degrees of external rotation to vertical. So why is that? Well, essentially we're trying to make sure that as the torso begins to rotate, there's this lag being mm -hmm. created. The torso goes, the arm stays behind, 
you create this stretch through the pec, stretch through the lat, now the arm has a chance to accelerate. But we want it to be in a position that it can actually accelerate and be pulled out and around, whip, and now it's in the plane of rotation. If we're way down here, we go to rotate, we're not in that plane of rotation. Way up here, we're not. Way inside right. 90 degrees, we're not. Yeah, way pushing. outside, we're not. And so, to your point, we're just trying to make sure that like, when the time is right in, the, in that sequence of events, the arm is in a good spot to actually continue that, that chain of energy. Absolutely. So I thought it might be, not that we haven't been demo demonstrating stuff, but it might be useful to almost like go through, like not that there's one ideal arm action, but like go through an example of like a high level arm action in like super slow motion. And we can kind of pick apart like what we're looking for, what's going on. Not that they should be thinking about every position that's happening while they're throwing, but just from like an educational standpoint, from a coach's standpoint, like what are we looking for? What are we seeing? So it might just be useful for us to go through. You see a guy throwing. What are we ideally like looking for during this part? Yeah, so for me, like just getting to that part, I'm always looking into leg lift. I want to see a little bit of flexion um, just because that's going to put you in a good position, like getting into that position that you were just in. Because um, for me, a lot of times I'm seeing guys get to early extension in the back. And there's two things I'm looking for after that is, okay, what does the back hip look like? You know, is the back hip running out of extension early? So then the back goes a little bit early and then you get extended here. And now all of a sudden this is grinding to get up, probably hit scap traction a little early. Yeah, you, you can tell you just ran out of room right yeah, away. And then there. immediately when you're extended here and you're stuck here, well now what's the option? Most likely guys are gonna dump this to buy themselves the time. The option is to go here. Yeah, and then get off plane. That way you see that elbow start to climb up and guys chase the arm forward and up. So that's the big thing that I'm looking for. Just is not, not extending early here because then you run out of room with the actual arm. Yeah, pressure. yeah, and, and something, something you could look back on, like if, if you've you know, not struggled with extension and now all of a sudden you are, maybe your arm's feeling like it's not getting up on time. Really look at that back hip to say, okay, like, you know, am I, do I have the same range that I used to? Because if you're running out of room there, you're going to cheat it getting here and then now all of a sudden you're grinding up and if the arm's late, I know it's, it's tempting just to look at the arm and like you said, get, to, get on the fly wall, start doing a bunch of 10 toes. Right. But you know, back chain it a little bit for yourself and understand, okay, why am I getting into this position? Why is my shoulder grinding up? Start from there because you know, 80% of the time, that's probably yeah. gonna be the answer. Especially if it, you know, maybe it looks good on certain, like, certain drills and then when you add in the back leg, you add in a leg lift, suddenly it goes to crap, you know, goes yeah. to shit. And that's, that's how you know, like, okay, we, we just, we looked great on like arm action drills and then suddenly we added in a leg lift and it's like, nope, now I'm getting stuck. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it just all looks terrible. Well, what do we add in? We just added in a leg lift and suddenly some move is throwing off the entire sequence of events. Mm -hmm. So to your point, that definitely can be a big limit. So we're ideally looking for in a perfect world, there's some, some posture element of it. Um, one of the things I look for is as they break their hands, is there some sort of capture of momentum? Is there some sort of rhythm? And is there some sort of like capturing of momentum of the downswing? So we'll, we'll refer to this as like a pendulum action. Um, again, difficult if a guy just immediately like stabs and then lifts because now they're not freely capturing that momentum from hand swing. And again, it doesn't need to necessarily be the same path. Like you'll see guys like Ben Joyce where they're still capturing momentum and it's a little more of a hand driven path as opposed to more of an elbow driven path, but they're both, you can see longer, longer arm swings that capture it well. You can see shorter arm swings, Joe Kelly, that still capture it well, but how well can you capture that? Again, you're trying to create seamless loops of energy that transfer, ultimately get into the plane of rotation. So from this path, um, another thing that I, I kind of look for is the direction of the break. What, what, we can talk about this in a little bit. Um, we get scap retraction stuff, but when guys break too horizontally, it can tend to throw a wrench into everything because now they start really counter rotating and the next move out of there is to open up. Whereas you almost want to, you typically want to look for a little bit more of a pendulum in line with the target where that actually allows the next move from here allows the arm to flip up. Because this is something I struggled with for a long time is I thought, okay, you read that scap retraction is important. So shouldn't we just try to like get into scap retraction as soon as possible? Shouldn't our immediate thought be to just like load our scaps? And so my arm action forever was like, was here. I would end up landing, being late, because I was trying to load my scaps so hard, just trying to like throw as hard as I could from my upper half. And then what would happen? I'd have nowhere to go. 
and I would start to rotate open. And it wasn't until I got like here that my arm actually got into a vertical position. And it was just a very inefficient path. Suddenly I just stopped like trying to bring the arm into the throw too soon, trying to like load my scaps horizontally and making that the sole focus, allow the actual pendulum action to be that initial driving force. And again, it's gonna be a little different for everybody, but not being so horizontal and for most guys being a little bit more in line. There's still gonna be some aspect of it going behind the center of your body to get you into retraction. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that before you? Yeah, so that's that's one thing with a cue that I've uh, I've heard. Actually, first time I heard it was Chandler Day, who was the Vanderbilt starter, played pro ball with, and we were talking about just taking the ball out of our gloves. Um, and he said, you know, I don't even think I have a ball in my hand when I take my arm out. I'm strictly thinking about the elbow coming back through. And that's something that, you know, I began to implement. But as time went on and I gave it to more guys, you know, some of my athletes that I was coaching, you have to understand that like cues like that are probably going to be very beneficial for some, but then detrimental, just like the action that you were doing there. Whereas some kids are going to, you know, conceptualize taking that, taking the elbow out of the glove as yanking back through there instead of, you know, that pendulum action that you talked about just with the elbow. And so that's something to understand is like, if a cue works for one guy and you're, you're giving it to a lot of people, you have to understand, okay, what is that cue making me do? And it could be, you know, something on video that you see, okay, that's just not for me, or it could be work really well for somebody else. hundred percent. And that's why I would again, take everything with a grain of salt that yeah. we're saying. And it's, it's giving you a general concept. It's something to test at certain points in the year, depending on the context. If you're in the middle of the season, like doing well, like don't go and start messing with your arm action. But this is again, just giving overall context yeah. for things to try. Um, from that point, I, I found that initial, initial loading direction is super important because that kind of sets up what happens in flip yeah. up, which sets up what happens in rotation. So if our first move is here, we're kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. But if our first move gets us in, you know, even like here, we're not even at flip up yet, but there's pretty much nowhere for the arm to go besides flipping up with good timing, assuming you have the mobility for it. If you can relax and get yourself in a decent position, decent loaded position and relax. So for me, that that's when I started to be, be able to actually get some degree of like, this position you see all the hard throwers get into for the most part is like the arms on time, their scap retracted, their hips are starting, their hips are open at landing, the shoulders are closed. And it's like, you know, that guy's gonna throw hard. Mm -hmm. But I just chased that position, had no idea how they were doing it for so long. I'm like, how, how are they doing it? Like, I have good mobility. Like I have, I have like plenty of ability to separate. Like, why can't I do that? But it was linked to that initial first move. But to that point, like in a perfect world, you know, you're looking for some degree of daylight which we call the flip up, but it's, it's really scap retraction. It's scap retraction behind the body. Um, some people refer to it more like horizontal abduction, which horizontal abduction is more like, just like from the humerus, it's more like ball and socket, as opposed to scap retraction is actually like the scaps retracting, which I would argue is what we, what we truly want. You actually want the humerus to be like centered in the shoulder as we move back here. So you don't want it to be horizontal abduction, you actually want it to be more true scap retraction when you get to that position. So you're in this position. Now there's some degree of daylight from the front view between the, the back of the head and the arm. Again, you're not going to see that in everybody. Shohei Otani, like guys with a little bit lower mobility aspect, it's, you're not going to see like massive amounts of daylight, like in a Ben Joyce example in everybody, but you're looking for some degree of scap retraction. And again, that scap retraction is important because now we're able to actually access applying force over longer range of motion first off like you imagine okay the guy that's back here on time foot down how far can he apply force to the baseball well, he can apply force to the baseball in three dimensions from back here all the way to ball release the guy who like is essentially here doesn't have the same level of scap retraction like how far can he apply force to the ball well he can apply force to the ball from here to there before he has to let go of it so all is equal the guy that can apply force over longer range of motion that's one aspect for sure. But also now, because you're in an end range position, you're actually able to access the elastic components of the upper body. So you're able to actually access like the elastic component of the pec, the lat, whereas like you don't really get it. If you, if you try throwing and like your arm is just out here, like you never actually feel that like pull. You never get like a pull from your lat, pull from your pec, and the ball just like shoots out when you do it right. If you're, and I just remember the distinct feeling when I did that right for the first time is I was so used to just like yanking here and it almost, it just feels like so inefficient 
when you go back to that because it's like a very tricep driven pushing type arm path when you don't get into that inner range pulling feeling. Yeah, I mean, just to build off of you guys, I think like just anything from handbrake, you know, handbrake going down, like takeaway phase, whatever you want to call it. I think like a lot of guys tend to, you know, when they're over obsessing about trying to like get deep, like a deep pec stretch or a deep flip up, like you see a lot of torsos that tend to like overcompensate too, where they'll really try and just like overreach, kind of like Bumgarner-esque, where they just get this giant reach. And then I'm gonna keep referencing this because I truly believe it's a really important thing is just like looking at it from a sequencing perspective is like if you get all this range and like you really try and reach back with the arm and like let it work back here and try and like let it relax. This is something that I ran into is like if I'm really trying to just relax and get here, well, I get over kind of rotated. I might have all this range back here, but when the actual front foot lands and gets in the ground and that sequencing starts from, you know, getting the lead leg in the ground, even though I'm deep, I'm getting pulled out of it kind of when I go to landing just because I'm getting so far back. And that was one of the mistakes I made up front was just like thinking like, okay, I really need to just let this like relax back. And I took it to the extreme because originally I was the guy that was like pronate out of the handbrake, get this giant kind of view said the shoulder gets really forward. I really couldn't go back anywhere. And so then the only place that I could go was to let the arm hike up. And that's why I had the high elbow kind of inside 90 pattern. So then I took it to the extreme and went here. And then when I would get into landing, it was, I'd get pulled out of it, kind of what you said. So I didn't have, even though in my mind, I felt like I was getting more range of motion, when it actually mattered, when that front foot gets in the ground and the pelvis starts, like then I was getting pulled out of it. So I actually didn't have usable separation at that point because the arm was so far back and open. Yeah, which that's another risk of just getting myopic and chasing like max scap retraction is your body's gonna find a way to cheat to try to, to try to accomplish that. Like for me, like the best, the best is when I don't even have to like worry about trying to force scap retraction. It's just like floating, floating, being patient with the arm, it's allowing the arm to pendulum and like feeling tension of the lower half and just letting this kind of take care of itself versus like what I had originally done in high school, which is like really try to force it this way. Or in your case, when you tried to really force it, it led to forcing it this way. Yeah. And both are, both are compensations that ultimately, if you look at the big picture of the delivery are interfering with the ability to actually sequence the overall throw from the ground up. Yeah. And I didn't have a lot of range of motion to go back here anyways. Like I was dealing with a lot of like AC joint stuff, shoulder. So every time I would like try and get the arm to work back, it would kind of pinch. That's why I was kind of pronating out. So just going back, we can to get in the mobility side of things later. But like, that's just for me, what I, what's worked for me personally to get the arm in the right spot is to keep it relaxed and keep this piece just super, just calm. Is just to let the hip kind of just set the position of the torso, like out of leg lift. I'm here and then the arm just kind of floats and it has the room back here to work instead of me trying to force the torso to get back and let the arm work deeper. It's just kind of just like out of leg lift, wherever I'm at, now the arm kind of has a decent window back here to just get to the right spot to then work at the right time. Yeah, again, same thing we talked about before where it's like part of the point of the arm action is to like get it out of the way. Right. Like don't let it come into the throw and take over the throw too soon. I'll call that like hijacking the delivery, the arm, the arm like a guy's like, oh, things are going great, things are going great. And you like see them start to load their backside and then the arm just takes over. Yeah. Things are going great, nope, arm takes over. Sure. It's like, you just you need to be able to relax the arm until the lower half has had time to actually build up, boom. Now the arm can come into the throw. So that's again, a risk of getting overly myopic on the arm action. If we, get, if we continue through that, like there's some aspect of looking for a pendulum, looking for the arm to, looking at posture, looking for the arm to pendulum up, some degree of scap retraction, and or daylight, depending on the mobility of the guy, some degree of being in plane here, 90 degrees, around 90 degrees. From here, what's going on? We talked about the, the pec getting stretched, the pelvis gear, trunk gear, and then the arm. Um, I, I kind of refer to this as, you, you think of the arm spiral, but like usually people are thinking of the arm spiral as like this action, like the spiral staircase. But I've kind of been referring to this as, and again, I don't know if I can take credit for it, calling it this, but like the second arm spiral being like, this is the first part of the arm spiral. And then the second one is actually that. It's the arm looping out and around. Again, people see me demo it because I'm like, like a low slot, like sidearm, low three quarter guy. Like they think that they need to like exaggerate it, but really it's dependent on posture. So for a guy with a little bit more upright posture up here at landing, as they rotate that spiral is going to still match the plane in a high level thrower. So you look at like a James Karen Jack or like a high slot guy, Tim Linscombe, like Tim Linscombe was like as high posture as you can get. And so when everything came through, 
that's what resulted in that higher slot. But you look at ultimately what's going on, it's that arm relaxing in plane and it's spiraling out and around. It's elbow extension first and then it's shoulder internal rotation. And so that's what you see on mocaps is you wanna see the elbow extension then the shoulder internal rotation. And if those two things are happening together, usually what's happening, if you think about like elbow extension and internal rotation happening together, usually that's the guy there getting a little bit pushy with it as opposed to letting that truly whip out and around. And that's like, if you just relax and your arm's in plane on time and you rotate, that's like what your arm naturally wants to do. If you just get your arm up and rotate, like your arm will naturally find that like loose whip-like path. But that's kind of how I conceptualize the second arm spiral, which is often screwed up. We can talk about like different mistakes, but like when guys go way too heavy with different ball weights or like they're using 10 pound wrist weights or they're doing like super heavy stuff or they're, they're just like coached to like throw the back of the hand at the target. Like you start to see some really funky things where their, their arm no longer acts as a whip. Their arm acts as like this, this catapult or this like dart throwing position into ball release which we can argue about the pros and the cons of that. There's certainly big leaguers that do that, but majority of them, you know, especially the ones that are throwing 100 plus miles an hour are maximally turning their body into a whip as opposed to catapulting or dart throwing their way into ball release. Right. Okay, so we've touched on it a little bit, but let's go around and just discuss your personal like feel. Like, what are you thinking? Again, you, you've started to allude to it a little bit, but like, what are you thinking in your delivery and how do you, what are you feeling in your arm action at various stages? Maybe like big picture, like you might just say, I'm not thinking about arm at all. But if we break it down, like, okay, like what are you feeling here? If you had to put like words to it, what are you feeling here? What are you feeling in the ball release? You want me to start it off? Mm -hmm. Cool. So for me personally, like just out of here, I'm just trying to feel, like you said, create some sort of rhythm. For me, like help some kind of move where the hands are like kind of working with the leg lift has always just helped me create some aspect of rhythm before I'd be like really tense already into my set position. So then it would just lead to me just like this aggressive like glove tap stab out pattern, which I had for years. And of course, like it was just really not repeatable in terms of like, it just felt different every time. So what's been working for me lately, just being able to just like relax it just here, just like find a position, you know, I am a big fan of overhead windups just like in drill work like trying to just promote some sort of like rhythm out of leg lift to just create this just relaxed state i've always been super tight out of the stretch position so doing you know these actions here just kind of led to me out of handbrake to just be relaxed like it was allowing me to just and i, I was on the extreme end of really tight really tense inside 90 tilted like elbow driven guy so just getting away from all things there, learning how to kind of just like float the arm down the mound. I'm always telling a lot of my guys who you just see, like it's not even arm actions that are tense, but like they're just tense out of handbrake. They're getting stuck on the back hip. We're really not moving down the mound at all. It's just like, hey, float down the mound. Like let your body just like out of handbrake, just float down the mound and just like let this kind of just work. And then they do it one time on like, let's say like a one mile per hour pin day or just like a sub max day. And they flick a decent number with some radar feedback and they're like, dude, felt like I wasn't even trying. And I'm like, there's something to that. It's just like getting them to kind of understand. So for me personally, out of handbrake, just letting this, like I said, the gears thing, just let this build up, get to the right spot. I really am just trying to feel kind of like you said, a little bit of a downswing while this is going down, just rhythm. And then once I kind of get into landing, you know, I'm feeling this work kind of up Going back to the retraction side of things, like I think a big thing that guys tend to forget is retraction isn't just like arm going back or like the torso going back or just a pendulum. There is an aspect of like when you're loading here and the pelvis starts rotating and the arm flips up, like that's creating a little bit more of that retracted state where it's like this is flowing and it's just resisting rotation for a split second. Like that action of the pelvis turning, the arms flipping up, I create that little bit of lag. And then from here, now I kind of accelerate. Yeah. That's where I'm applying intent. That's kind of the feeling that I am personally chasing. And that's the scapular dig piece too, of like, you can, you can get to whatever point you can naturally relax into, but it isn't until like, there's, a, there's this amount of retraction here that I can just like get into without like totally in isolation. Yeah. And then there's that position right there. And that's actually now more relative scap retraction because now relatively speaking, my trunk has gone, my arm has stayed back. And so it actually like screws the scap into yeah. 
full scap retraction that you wouldn't be able to get to just right here. And that piece is also like helping keep the torso a closed a split second longer as well as like when I'm going down and I'm trying to just stay patient while I'm going to rotate here. It's like as that pelvis starts to turn or actually start to rotate and this starts to flip up, that little moment of this flipping up resists rotation just that like that second. And then it's just like, I really don't think about anything here other than just close the gap from like my right hand and the ball release like into my lead hip. Like I'm trying to just basically from here to here, accelerate the rotation like as fast as I can. Like if I'm going on a, for a, you know, a testing day or something, that is my feel. So pretty relaxed upper half, allowing the focus to be more on just like rhythm lower half. Yeah. And then once you actually get to landing, that's when you bring the arm into the throw and like just try to close the back gap as fast as possible from the hand yeah. into ball release. Like controlling the center basically down the mound, just like trying to really just set myself up to be in the right position. So once the front foot lands, everything can funnel up. If I get tense too early, which is what I used to do when I was throwing 85 max effort spraying balls to the wall, like I would just be super tense trying to just like really tight. Like I'd get overly stuck here. My arms just like stabbing. And then the only place I really could go would be to just like really tense and downhill dump into the left side oblique. And then from here, the only thing I could do, you know, into landing now was just like pull off to the left, drive the elbow. It was just this very like cutty pattern. So learning that, hey, Everything before front foot is just about setting the body up to be in the right place at the right time. Completely changed my perspective on like, how do we actually get a guy to throw really, really hard? And like, it's not to say that the stuff before, you know, before front foot lands doesn't matter. It matters the most. It's just like, hey, too many guys overcomplicate the process of doing way too much There's too early. Like a max force output piece Absolutely. before landing. Like, it's, it's not about like how much force you can put into the rubber. Right. Like, in one one millisecond right. like there's really no max force piece of the, the delivery from here to like just to just before landing you're right. setting up you're loading tension through the backside, through the trunk through the torso you're keeping relaxed you're getting in a position to where right at landing now you can absorb that force and, then and transfer it with the gear analogy up yep. the chain that's exactly what i'm going for is just don't do anything to mess up the positioning of when that front foot gets down. Like if we can just set our body up to be in the right place at the right time, arms just chilling, get to the right spot. It's like once that front foot gets down, everything can funnel and it's been working so far. Yeah. What about you, Leif? Yeah, so for me, a little different than I think most guys start out. Well, not really start out because I started out the same way, but using a heavy ball to warm up in your beginning throws. Um, it's something that, you know, when you first you get your first weighted ball set, whatever it is. And, you know, a lot of times what we're, what we're taught or what you think just normally is, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go heavy to light. Like heavy ball is gonna put me in these good actions and I'm gonna get lighter, lighter, lighter to speed up the arm and then go to my baseball throws. Um, for me, growing up, and especially in JUCO when I gained a lot of miles per hour, a big thing for me was just feeling that my hand was working, like first of all and then progressing weight from there. So for me, I'm way more of a flow guy, uh, glove side included, you talked about your figure eight thing. For me, it starts with my hand to where I'm feeling something that I can be flowy with. And then my glove side just kind of naturally happens with that. From there, I would start to increase weights up to my baseball throws. Um, and then when I get the baseball in my hand, it starts to feel like just connection of the hand. It, it, it feels almost like weightless. And that's kind of the feeling that I'm chasing is I want the baseball in my hand to feel as similar to that as I can. And doing that progression for me, going from open hand throws, now this is lightly, not, not ripping open hand throws, but going through my open hand progression and then going to say, you know, a three ounce, four ounce, and then ending at a five to where I feel that I am flowing as if I didn't have the ball in my hand, that sets me up for a good position that I can work into onto the mound. Um, the next piece of that is I really like walk step behinds, walking in your catch play to start because you're starting to initiate momentum, you know, with that move that you just created and on the plow wall, wherever you're at. And then what my goal for me, capturing that with a step behind, right? Initial momentum that you can't really create on the mound unless you're doing a walking windup. So this is where the drift was such an unlock for me into supplying my arm with energy, right? So I would always feel so good with my walking, you know, step behinds and catch play. 
and then get to the mound and kind of miss that, miss that juice that the arm would catch in catch play. And, you know, it was always the guy in catch play where people didn't want to play catch for me because it just popped out. And I was like, I'm not trying to throw hard. It just happens and get on the mound. And it's maybe, you know, 88 or something where other guys threw harder. And that's where like supplying, supplying the arm with energy for me translated. First, I understood that, okay, when I give myself momentum, I'm good. I catch a good position. And then so for me, the arm drifting down the mound is important for me because it supplies energy to the chain that then I can put to the arm that I worked on patterning with the open hand stuff that I would do. Um, so that's the big piece for me is like, how, do, how am I capturing energy? Where am I getting the energy from? And then do I feel natural with the arm as it gets up and gets ready to fire forward? Can you explain the open hand drill a little bit more for people that are just trying it? Because I've, I've seen you use that with a lot of your guys as like, again, first thing in there. They still do like their bands or their dynamic warm up and all that stuff. They're still getting yeah. warm, but then like before they even pick up a ball, you're having them kind of go through like this little patterning thing. Could you talk through how you would coach a guy through the open hand thing? And like, what is it about the open hand? Is it just that like it's keeping them in a neutral wrist position? Is it that that like encourages them to just relax? Just yeah. talk through how you'd coach somebody through that little like pre-throwing uh, warm up drill. Yeah. So for me, the things I always say is letting letting your fingers feel like they're made of paper, like wind affects them heavily and you want to have them affected the most amount that you can. And what I mean by that is like, if I go through here and I do that, I can feel like my fingers kind of wave through and I can feel air coming through them. Now I want the same thing on the takeaway, but for the back of the fingers. So I feel that as I come through here, I can feel that air coming through my fingers. And then you can like hear it in your ear of the and a lot of the mistakes that I'll see guys make with this is like they'll, you know, they'll kind of get this like pronated feel and they'll just be like karate chopping through. It's not the feeling you want. Sometimes guys get tense. Sometimes they're pushy, like Aero was saying. Sometimes he's pushy through, maybe a little too supinated going into this and you're, you know, you're cranking on that shoulder as you whip through. What this does is establishes just a feel of, okay, I'm feeling flow. And that starts to help you understand, like you said, what that stretch feels like between the arm and the glove, because the impulse of it is happening so many times over a short period of time, because you're just flowing through and I feel, boom, stretch there each time. So I'm here, stretch, stretch, and I'm getting to that good position and creating daylight, like we said earlier. And the reason why I move from the open hand to the three, to the four, to the five is because I think there does need to be a bridge. Like you, I don't think it works as well if you just go through your open hand and then put a five ounce in your, in your hand. I think that bridge puts you up to the five ounce and carries over more of the feeling of that natural just, okay, what do I feel like when my arm is just weightless, right? And that for me has had a lot of success with guys that really gravitate towards, let's say like a blue ball throw or a red ball. A lot of guys that say the seven ounce is their favorite ball because a lot of times they're, you know, they're climbing up, they're doing something compensating for that heavy ball over time. And these are guys that have been throwing heavy plyos for years and years and years. And they gotten themselves in this position where it's like they're almost, they're almost training towards throwing that heavier ball. And so taking the opposite approach and, you know, learning how to capture momentum without any weight in your hand can be important. Yeah, I think that that brings up the idea of like, again, not to get, not to get too sidetracked, but it's, it's worth like explaining the difference between like the heavy ball specialists and the light ball specialists. Again, not everybody that we coach even throws weighted balls or plyos. Mm -hmm. um, a, a decent chunk does, doesn't, or do, you, know, you don't need that to actually improve velocity per se. Um, but you have guys who they tend to really gravitate towards the heavy balls and then guys who, um, you know, they, they've never had a problem with like quick arm. So they throw the underweight balls really well. So like, what is, what can we learn from, you know, maybe the velocities between the different ball weights or if the guys uh, typically throw heavy balls well or the vi vice versa, like guys who only throw the light balls really well. Uh, what, do, what do we typically see in terms of like the profiles of those two different camps of guys? Do you want to take it? I mean, usually kind of just building off of your thing, like I've had experience with both, like throwing light balls pretty fast. And then like the heavy balls are like, 
I prefer to warm up the heavy to the light if I was doing like a full like testing day or something. But I've had guys like, you know, I'll use Jim for example. Like Jim has been up to like an 86, 87 red and then he'd get on the mound with a baseball. Not anymore, but he'd get on the mound and throw an 88. And it was just like, there was a huge disconnect in terms of what was happening. And like, I kind of talked to him and you know, this was, we got a stalker. We thought Some it was a radar. for Jim, he's what, 6'8", 260? He's 6'8", yeah, 260. Like giant dude, strength numbers are out of this world. Throws the heavy like, balls really well. Yeah. Yeah, relative to everything yeah like one of the best in terms of just overall just like power strength metrics like crazy athlete um but you know when you got an actual normal baseball in his hand or any sort of underload it was just one of these things where it was like there was just a huge disconnect going on and it was just like one of these things where we need to take a step back and realize like hey you were really really good at throwing these heavy balls but when we get a baseball in your hand you know patterns just tend to break down. He was very early with the torso. The arm was just kind of like not slotting into plane. Like it was getting low outside. And it's like when he had the heavier ball for some reason, it was just like he was able to leverage it, get it going. And like, it was very minute stuff, but for him, it could just be like one of those things where like the feeling of just having a heavier implement, he could just for like get it through and it feel a lot better. And then like taking a step back, we actually introduced some lighter implements just to see like what would happen. And so we did a little bit of like, you know, a four ounce blend. I usually stay away from three unless it's a very specific case. That's just me personally. Um, I also never have experience like testing out of threes. So it's like just one of those things where it was like four is usually kind of, if I'm trying to get a guy to feel something, a lighter implement, it's kind of what I gave him. So we, we tried some fours, had some success up front. Like he got like a little shuffle 100 with it, which was actually really good for him. Um, but we kind of bridged off and realized like, Hey, the root of the problem, like in this, was just come from maturing as a coach as well as just understanding you know what happens in a high velocity delivery is like the sequence of everything was just completely botched when he picked up a baseball and so we actually scrapped the majority of his plyo drills i gave him two drills like hey here's an arm action drill just like one feel kind of the blue the red like something you're good at i think it's important if you are really really good at something don't just get rid of it completely like you have an anchor there there's clearly something good out of that maybe we keep kind of rolling with it so just kind of giving them some constraints to really work on just like torso positioning arm action being relaxed going back to that and then we spent majority of our throwing going over to just like the, the wall with a radar gun. And, and I was just like, hey, we're gonna stay here until we just get better at like learning how to throw. And then now we've progressed that. Each week he's fully understanding now, like, hey, the torso has to be relaxed. I think with him being such like a 6'8", 260, He's just like, oh, I can just brute force everything. You know, when he's benching 275, he can brute force it. When he's throwing a med ball, he can brute force it and get some crazy numbers. But in terms of throwing, you know, the goal is to get him to be a mid 90s thrower. We have to learn that concept of like letting the chain actually like letting the sequence happen. Don't get this involved too early because no matter how powerful and this goes into strength metrics and stuff like so many guys are like i deadlift this i long toss this but it's like if you get on the mound and you're putting your body in a really bad position to send energy up the chain you're not going to get more velocity per se like you'll get to an extent based on strength and power numbers but you will hit a kind of a rocky road if you're throwing like jim was and like this your threshold will ultimately be capped by your capped by your sequencing that's, which is why it's so difficult. Like there's no such thing as like a velocity formula yeah. unless you find a way to model like sequencing into that, into that formula. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just super simple. Like just do these strength numbers and you'll throw X velocity. Like there's a reason it doesn't work. There's a reason we get hundreds of emails a year from people that have tried that. They're like, I'm throwing 83, but I'm so strong. Like I'm doing all these things. Why am I not throwing 90? It's like sequencing is the answer. And to your point, like if there's somebody who already has like quote unquote good sequencing, then maybe you can just purely leverage like, okay, the letter balls are gonna focus more on the velocity end of the, like the power equation, force and velocity. Like you're gonna focus more on the velocity, the relaxation side of it. That's what you're, you know, you seem to really prefer with yourself and then some of those stronger guys. The heavier balls are gonna focus more on that force application, the force side of the, the equation for like maybe the weaker fast switch guys who just like, their arm just kind of flops. If it's quick, it flops, but they don't have the force side of that equation. Um, but neither of those kind of matter if there's an underlying, like if you have a guy who's just like flying way open, it's like you can do all the weighted ball throwing you want and all the pull downs you want and all the heavy balls or light balls you want. But like if there's a huge, just like gross limiting factor in terms of how they sequence their body, like none of it matters. You'd be way better off like reframing how they use their lower half, figuring out how they use the lower half or getting everything on time and sequence properly before you start adding in like quote unquote velo training or different weighted balls. Like 
sequencing ultimately has to happen or it's going to be your rate limiter for strength, everything else, like nothing matters. Yeah. Which getting back to your point on just on that, like I have one more thing on that is like when I first started coaching when I was younger, I mean, I'm still a young coach in the grand scheme of things right now, but like I was really big on like, you know, hey, you got your five to six plyo drills, you have your, you know, your heavy to light. It was very like stock in terms of just like programming side of things. The more I've thrown myself, thrown harder and actually fully started to understand like there's a lot of other pieces that kind of unfold. I think the general population of just like baseball, it's very easy to grab a plyo set and just like go into a plyo testing, you know, two times a week. And it will get you to, you know, there is a little bit of a gain up front. And at some point, like like you said, if you're trying to, if your goal is to be a big leaguer, you're trying to like get to 95 plus, like there's another level to that. It's like, you can't just intent your way all the way to just like expecting the velocity is going to continue to climb. Like there is going to be some, especially if you're not throwing as hard as you want, there is going to be probably an underlying mechanical issue that we have to address. So my approach with my guys who have been the 88, 91 mile per hour indie ball guys who were trying to make their way into affiliate has been less about like, hey, let's just go test, you know, twice a week. Let's just kind of just go and just, hey, we'll work on some mechanical stuff on our half plow days or our light days, but then we're just gonna test, 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 test. And you're basically putting effort on very faulty patterns. And then they end up plateauing very quick. They end up burning out very quick. The shoulder, something with the shoulder, the elbow starts to come up. So my personal approach, and like everybody's gonna be different, different context for each guy. But like my personal approach has been more of like, hey, once a week, we're gonna have those flick days. We're gonna learn to try and like up the floor. We're gonna try and really focus on patterning. What is your biggest underlying issue? What is the biggest bucket mechanically that needs to be filled? All of our drills are gonna be tailored around trying to fix that big, big issue. Yeah, you might have a couple of like arm action positional stuff that we can work on in like a half plow day or on the side, but like our 90% in my opinion, like 90% of the focus should be going on these major issues in the delivery and we learn how to clean those up. And then like, like I said, it gets to the point where guys are like, dude, I feel like I'm not even trying. So the big breaking point for Jim was the first day that he had like a one mile per hour pin day, which are typically for him was like an 86, 88 day. And he flicked 91 and he was like, dude, like that was easy. And it was like, yes. And it was like, and looking at the patterns, torsos finally, you know, staying closed, the arms working into it. And then we ended up, now I feel like he was in a really good position to apply effort. Then it was like, hey, let's get into a competitive environment. Let's turn on some jams. Like, let's go out and like have a good day and just like let it, let it eat and like let the body work. And then his first warm up flick of the day was 93. And he was like, I got it. And it was just 94, 94, 94. And it was one of those like big aha moments for him where it was like, hey, like, I have to keep this relaxed. I have to let all of this work. The arm action just needs to be in the right spot. And instead of like just plyo testing them to, you know, the end and like just pull downs and all this stuff, which have their place in a guy's programming somewhere along the way. But it was just for him, educating him on what we were trying to do, actually letting him understand how the throw unfolds. He's an older guy. Like there is gonna be some risk. You don't wanna just like completely dump a ward vomit to like a 14 year old. But for Jim, who is 25, 26, who is getting close into the end of his career in terms of the grand scheme of things, is like we have to educate, in my opinion, to get him to get to mid 90s and get more out of it, which was a big piece for him. Yeah, that's, I think that's such an important point is realizing that there's still, the, the high intensity max effort days is like not where you have to, you know, that's not where the main focus needs to be, where, people approach velocity programs or like traditionally weighted balls. It's like, I'm just gonna buy these weighted balls and like, I'm not getting anything out of them unless I'm throwing them as hard as I possibly can. Yeah. It's like this idea of like, everything has to be max intent to get anything out of them. It's like sh completely shifting the focus. What you're discussing is like, no, our focus is actually on like effortless velocity on sequencing on efficiency. And so you're getting every bit as much out or actually more out of like a 85% touch field day where you're seeing like how easily can I throw 85, 90% of my peak velocity as opposed to like how hard can I grunt to try to like add one mile an hour to my top end velo. And it's just like a completely different approach of like chasing the top end number versus like bring up that floor, bringing up that like easy 92 from like, oh, that was easy 87 before, now it's easy 92. And then once we've gotten the efficiency down, the sequencing down, now you can add the intensity on top of it. Now, boom, now you have a, now you have a max effort 95 yeah. instead of max effort 91, easy 87. And it's been such a hard thing to shift guys' focus because like they grow up on like, you know, like free velocity programs that are out there. It's such a hard thing to get them to buy. Like 
before, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, is like I would go into my half plow days or like a light day and like you're, you're going through your drills, but there isn't a lot of intention behind like why you're doing that for that specific day. A lot of my guys, I preach the importance of like, hey, these days where you're not going high effort and you're not just going full tail are equally as important, if not more important, to just understand like the feeling of like where are the positions that we need to get into. And so now they take them a lot more serious. They realize like, hey, like I don't need to just rip to make progress and throw hard harder. It's like those days are just output days where, hey, let's see if we're making the patterns are changing, if we're getting these things to, that we're working on on these other days, are we getting them to go high effort? And don't get me wrong, there is a time and place where it's like guys are going to move more efficiently at higher efforts. And like, that's just something where maybe you give them more high effort days because they're moving better. And like, and then we can figure out from there. But I just think in general, making sure athletes understand that these low intent days are just as important from just like a learning and sequencing standpoint of like just get to the right spot you're training you're ingraining i've made the most progress on my days where i'm not ripping i spent years of my career just putting a neck 10 feet away and just max effort ripping and like yeah i got 90 91 great but i would get 60 feet and like i have these patterns that are like super downhill inside 90 very aggressive like i created some really really bad compensation patterns to where it was like it didn't help me actually play the game like i couldn't throw a strike you know arm flying out like sailing balls i couldn't play catch because i was just ripping so i got so accustomed to this tight tense early torso elbow driven arm action i was a good enough athlete to scrap the 90. But like, that wasn't my ultimate goal. It was like, you know, I want to throw 95. And then I had to kind of tear down some layers. I had to check myself at the door and realize like, hey, all this effort days that I'm putting into it really isn't helping me. Even though it feels good to get that 190, like, you know, you feel comfort in that. I had to step away and realize like, hey, let's flick some 88s. Let's flick some 87s. And now it's 91. Now my flicks are 90, 91. And it's like, I want to flick 92, 93. So I can go get that five. Like, that's my approach now that I've, become a more mature thrower in terms of what, what I'm trying to do. I'm getting athletes to understand those importance of doing that. I think it's important to give context too that like we're, we're focusing on, you know, improving arm action efficiency for the sake of like, this is a guy who, who otherwise his career is essentially over relative to where he wants to be. Um, this isn't to say that like command stuff isn't, isn't absolutely. important at certain times of the year, like you're absolutely the focus needs to be command at certain times. It's like, we need to teach you uh, gyro slider or sweeper yeah. or it's pitch shapes or, or fastball profile. It's not that none of these things are important. This is like in specific context of like, hey, you have an indie ball guy or high school kid, like he is throwing 88. Like he does not have a career in a year if he doesn't throw 95. Right. So like, and you know, he's strong enough. Like the only way he's going to get to that point is to improve these different efficient, like the efficiency of how he's, of how he's moving. So this isn't like we're chasing patterns, chasing positions for the sake of like looking like a textbook, but like just to like look good at yeah. landing because like for the sake of looking good at landing because certain MLB guys do. This is specifically in this context of like, this guy is does not have a career if he does not throw 95. If And he's not going to throw 95 unless he gets his arm on plane or he gets his his trunk closed because we understand how, how the connect chain actually works. And there's sometimes you do need to just like focus on the improving the efficiency of the, of the, the delivery before you can just say like, cause some coaches would say, well, why does any of this matter? Like, I want to know if he's throwing strikes. I want to know if he can locate a curveball. It's like, we're, n we're not saying that stuff's not important. We're saying like for certain guys, like you do need to kind of peel back the onion a little bit, improve the efficiency to get the velocity where it needs to be. Now you add back, back in the command work, the pitch design work, put it all together. And that's how you generate a 95 mile an hour guy who also throws strikes with three, four five pitches. But it can't just be like only focus on command pitch shapes. Guy throws 88, 89, 91. You can do that, but his career's over in a year, and that's not why they're coming to us. Right. Um, I can get through my personal feels real quick, and then we're gonna go through some different like flaws and just give guys, like if that's something they're struggling with, like one fix from each of us. Um, for me personally, um, I resonate most with like how you described it, a little less to how you described it. Um, a big key for me was the hands over the head cue. Um, I don't actually place a ton of focus uh, or mental like energy on what my, arm is doing during the throw because I find that if I can just keep it relaxed, keep it out of the throw, that it tends to just clean up and get in good positions on its own. So for me, in my delivery, I'm, so I'm, I'm most comfortable with like kind of a hands over the head approach, especially in like a wind up position. But the hands over the head allows me to, I almost think of it as like a bridge. I allow the, the arms to delay coming into the throw and I'm allowing the focus to be on the lower half in the first move. And so I'm really just trying to like 
there's no focus on the hands. It's really just like the scaps are kind of floating everything. Like my arms are just floating on a cloud. And I'm getting through this initial loading piece, coiling, turning, trying to ride the lower half, very similar to your feel. And I'm just letting the arms naturally float up into position. So it's literally like this feel right here and letting the lower half be the complete focus of the throw. And then the arms, because I'm floating, because I'm allowing that motion to happen, the arm just ends up somewhere around here. And then it isn't until actual landing that as soon as this goes, I feel that, that pull and then I'm contracting as hard as I can. That for me, that pull is like, it feels like I'm throwing with my armpit. Like if, if I do it right, it feels like I have something to pull with because my arm is so far behind, behind my body. And it feels like I'm like, it almost feels like that. Like I'm ripping with my armpit as opposed to when I'm not getting that retraction position or the timing's not right. It feels like it's just tricep accelerating and like there's suddenly no like pull through my chest. I used to describe it to guys as like a stretch, but I don't think everyone actually feels like a quote unquote stretch, but generalizing it more to like you have something to pull with from your arm or like throwing the armpit is another way to think of it. So, and then the other thing, like I don't really think of my glove arm at all, but if I really try to take a step back and think about like what it's doing, I used to, I used to very early like turn over my glove arm and it was much more like this pattern right here. The way I kind of have, have learned to use it is it's much more of like creating tension with not just like back leg tension, but it's like tension through the entire chain. So it's like, if I was gonna go from like a position of absolute no tension to max tension, it would be like no tension, wind tension in the back hip, wind tension in the torso, wind tension in the glove side. And so like that position is like kind of the feeling of, not that like my elbow is tense, but like it's like tension from here. Tension from like the glove side shoulder, the trunk, and the back hip. And I know it sounds confusing if you're like, we're talking about like relaxing, 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 but there, it, it is kind of like, there's some degree of tension, but there's also some degree of relaxation at the same time. Where's the tension? The tension is really, it's floating, boom. The tension is in the back hip. The tension is in the trunk, holding torso rotation, a little bit of like tension. Uh, I don't know how you would describe this, but it's almost like a little bit of like thoracic rotation tension. You're loaded here, you're loaded here, and you're loaded there. And I like Pedro Martinez is a good example of like, you just imagine like Pedro Martinez is like first move and it's that position of tension. So even though like this is all feeling like totally relaxed, I think I am still feeling some degree of like glove side tension where I'm holding that closed, holding this closed, holding tension there. And because of that, because I have tension in those spots, everything else can relax. So it almost like stops this from opening up because I have that front shoulder in, like a little bit of like internal tension. It stops this from opening up because I have tension here, here, and here. And then I can just let everything else work. I've created tension there, and then I can let everything else work around that. So it's like, I can see why some guys would be confused when you're like, on one hand, create tension. On the other hand, you're like, be relaxed, Jim, be relaxed. But I thought you were supposed to create tension. It's like, where are you relaxed and where are you creating tension? I'm creating tension, trunk, back hip, glove side, shoulder, so that everything else can be relaxed. Neck can be relaxed, elbows, wrist, hand. All this is relaxed because now I know what I'm holding as I move forward down the mound. And that's what delays the trunk opening up early and the glove side pulling open early. Can I say something on that? Yeah. Just like for me, like tension, like I, I agree that there is some like the degree of tension. I think the, like the verbiage is gonna be different for everybody. Like the way that it's kind of just helped me is like the feeling of floating, but still loading. It's just like, I'm trying to just feel like some like stability, like the way I visualize it, just like some stability, like in these pieces, like there, it's stable. Like there's not just like a looseness like happening where I just feel like if you pushed me, like I would just fly. Yeah, it's everywhere. not just it's like, like Everything right. is just like a noodle. It's, it's like, like there's some, some, some degree of stability yeah. as you control yourself down. Like I'm still floating. I'm still like drifting or I'm still moving forward. But like 
in this position as I am floating. Like I'm staying stable to the point where it's like, if I had to, if I had to get knocked over, like I could still like redirect or I could still find some kind of like load in the pieces necessary. It's not just like, I'm like, hey, there's nothing here. I'm just like floating, I'm a noodle. Like, it's not like that. There is some component of just like contraction happening in the hip. Like I'm still loading here. It's just like, I'm still letting all of this relax. So when this works, then I can just capture all that and then get that final whip. And this, this reminds me of, if anyone's like heard of this, it's essentially proximal stability creates distal mobility or like phrase it differently. Like you can't shoot a cannon out of a canoe. It's like if that, if that back foot position, this is why it all matters. This isn't just an arm action podcast. If that back foot, like if you're slipping around, you're throwing on mud, your cleats are broken. You're like, you don't have like a firm footing. Like you can't, like none of what we're talking about works. Like I'm not, suddenly you're like throwing in mud. It's like, I can't, I can't like create the stability to like, like proximally from the ground through the center of the body, through the trunk to allow this all to be relaxed and work properly. So proximal stability, creating tension in like these proximal areas, torso, pelvis, riding that, that stability allows everything else up the chain to, to be able to relax and to be able to work as efficiently as it needs to. And I think the issue with like some guys is just like they get overly caught up on the idea of like tension to the point where they just never actually get themselves creating momentum down the mountain and actually like shift their center to actually you know, work into hip rotation. So they just like try and overly, like really kind of get stable, which is what I ran into is like, I would get so stuck on this back hip trying to focus on like, you know, tension or coiling to the point where it's like the arm, I was so stuck on the back hip, my arm just kept like going up and out and it just kept climbing. And then I had to like, eventually you have to go forward. So I would do that by defaulting to that. So learning, you know, for me, what I did a lot was just like some hovers to just feel that move of just like, feeling just that float down while still creating stability in the back hip. Like that's something that I did a ton, which helped me. Yeah, a, a lot of arm action issues are a result of like not, like the delivery is, the tempo is way too slow. Guys guys give themselves so long to screw things up. Um, we'll talk about like why like short stops happen to have like the best arm action on the field or catchers in a lot of scenarios. Like there's a time constraint there. Yeah. They don't have time to screw it up. And so if you're just like back here, you're giving yourself so long to just like, your arms trying to like, build in time, you get some like crazy like stabbing pads, you get the arm like climbing because like there's just so long for it to have to figure out what to do. Whereas like you have guys with like high tempos, like you look at Jacob Bikram, like high tempo, big drift guy. There's like no time for him to get in, in an inefficient position. There's an infielder fields a backhand has to turn the fucker. Like there's no time for him to like do all this funky, like crazy stuff because there's a time constraint there. So we can get into that um, a little bit more, but Let's move on. Let's go through some of these common flaws. I know we could talk about this for like yeah. a day straight. Um, poor layback. So Leif, you want to explain how would someone know if they have poor layback? Um, what are we actually talking about when we talk about layback? And like one cue or fix or something you look for when you see a guy with poor layback? Yeah, so I mean, layback in general is going to be a combination of a lot of things. Like the term layback, I think, you know, from a very narrow perspective, it's going to be that picture on the baseball card where the guy's, you know, arm is completely yeah, torqued. Billy back. Wagner. Yeah, exactly. So, so here, arm fully back. Yeah. So in a vacuum, like that's layback. That's what you see, and you go, "Oh, that guy throws hard. I see this. I need to do that." Um, from a broader perspective, there's you know a lot of things going on, just internally that are leading to that position. Um, a big thing, like when you're missing layback, and we talked about like the timing and being quick. Um, a lot of times, like, what do we not want to be quick? Well, we don't want the torso to be quick, you know, relative to the pelvis. Um, and a lot of times you'll see guys that, you know, maybe they pass the test, right? We, we take them through, through a screening and they have adequate layback just passively or through an active like partner test, but they're not showing that on the mound. And a lot of times that can be, you know, from that torso being early. And that also pairs with the extension that we talked about earlier of, if this is early and this is early here, you're just not giving yourself yeah. time to get into that That's position. the guy who's landing like, he's landing like this, or there's some timing issue. It's like, he might have the range on the table, but like he's landing here. There's like no actual chance for him to get into that layback before he has to release the ball. There's just like, no way he has to release the ball too fast. But yeah. suddenly, instead of him landing here, you get him landing here. It's like now his arm is actually in a position to accept the true magnitude of layback that he yeah. has, whether it's, 180 degrees, 200 degrees of total layback. Like you get him in a better position. Now he goes to rotate and the arm actually has room 
to lay back. He's in a bad position. Like it just physically isn't, it, there isn't time and space with the sequencing for it to happen. Yeah, and of course, we're talking about arm action, the last piece in the chain. So there's gonna be a lot of things leading up to it. Um, but you talk about like quick fixes for layback. One, you have to identify, do I have the range? Okay, so do you have the range? No, well then that's gonna be a whole another set of issues that you're gonna have to work through probably over a longer amount of time. There's not gonna be any torquing that you know, a player or a dad can do on your arm that is going to fix the layback within, you know, two, three days a week, whatever it is. Um, but in a vacuum of just the arm action, we talked a lot about doing certain drills to feel the position. Um, you can do drills to where, you know, maybe having a heavier implement and just feeling yourself, like do this action and feeling that, okay, I am timing up the position with scap retraction and I'm feeling that layback through, you know, incorporating timing with what, feeling you want to have. Like I said, if it's if there's a blockage there or something there, that's going to be a longer form issue that you're going to have to work through over time. But we're talking strictly about guys who have the ability to get to the range, going to the plyo wall, going through a tento, going through a pivot pick, something that allows you to feel the timing of, okay, my torso is working in this way when I get to those peak you know, times in layback. And you can video that and check that and then slowly progress that into what you're going to be doing on the mound. Got? Kind of agree with him on all of the uh, like leading up to it. There's so many pieces that are going to affect layback. Like if you're mostly torso related, like if I see a guy who doesn't have a lot of layback, I'm looking a lot at the torso. I'm looking a lot where in the landing, what position, where are we at? Like you said, if I'm here, you know, if I take a weight of the, the plyo, for example, like the ball is a weight in itself. Like if I turn like and just relax the arm, the ball's going to lay like kind of like go into this pattern here. So if I see a guy who's like down in the landing, they're here and then the torso's turning and they have this like pattern here, they don't, they don't really give themselves enough time and space in the shoulder to actually go into layback. So then they have these like darty, like pushy arm action. So I'm really just trying to see guys just like where are they at in the landing with the torso, you know, check them on the table, check them on just like how they move in certain constraints as well. That's important. Um, fixes for those guys. I'm typically like focusing a lot on positional stuff into foot strike, like where the foot is, how, how the arm is working up. I like figure eights for guys who are like have this kind of down pattern that open up and they don't give themselves room, like any sort of just like slow constraint where it's just like letting the arm float up, actually work, feel it where it needs to be, and then try and go is kind of what I give them a lot. Um, I'm a big fan with like heavy implement stuff, um, just to feel kind of like a heavier to relax and get to the right spots is what I typically do. So I think it's worth, uh, it's worth mentioning like the components of layback. And I know there's like a subset of PTs out there who, you know, you say like throw a heavy ball to get more layback and like instantly they all cringe and they're like, you're going to go tear up a whole generation of people's shoulders by like more layback, you're creating instability. They're going to go tear up their labrums. They're going to go tear up their shoulders. Like it's not about necessarily like increasing the gross range of motion at the actual glenohumeral joint. It's about if you're going to try, if you're trying to help a guy throw 95, if you're trying to help a guy maximally leverage his arm as a whip, we know that there's certain ranges of layback that exist. You're not having guys with 150 degrees of layback throw 95. You almost, I mean, maybe you see it once in a blue moon, but like you just don't see it. You have guys in the 170, 180, 190 range. And so if that's not happening, we need to look at the sequencing. We need to look at the range of motion. The biggest piece is that we're trying to leverage. It's not about creating more instability in like the, the capsule of the shoulder, like very rarely. There might be some consideration there. Again, we have an in-house therapist. With like that, that might be a consideration, but we look at the components of layback. There's the aspect of just purely like glenohumeral external rotation, right? On a table, that guy might have 110 degrees. If he's loose, he might have 95 degrees, but there's some aspect of glenohumeral external rotation. That's typically like not something you're gonna mess with a ton. That might increase a couple degrees over the course of a season. Maybe that increases a couple degrees from throwing weighted balls, but we're not necessarily trying to increase like gross external rotation. But then this is where we have a lot more influence. There's the actual scapular posterior tilt, which is the scapula, the shoulder girdle, being able to actually tilt behind your body. So you have maybe 90, 100, 110, depending on the guy. Then there's a certain amount of range that happens from the actual scapula tilting. Okay, cool. We just got another 20 degrees from that position. Like you can see just standing here. Now I go from that much. I bring the scap into it. Now I've got another 20 degrees. Then you go to the actual thoracic extension, the rib cage. When a guy is at ball release or at peak layback, he's also in a position of extension. So you're starting to tie all these pieces together and figure out 
again, then there's the dynamic action of actually throwing, the ball actually lays you back. And so like for me, I'll get to easily 180 degrees uh, dynamically, but like just standing here, like trying to get into positions like 140, like one fit, whatever. So there's a dynamic action to it too, but we can influence that posterior tilt and we can influence the thoracic extension. We can influence the ability to extend through the spine, scap to posteriorly tilt. And I would argue you're actually creating healthier shoulders if you do that, because now your arm's gonna, you're, like, you're gonna get some degree of, like the arm is gonna be laid back by the, by the ball, yeah. like by that force. But if we can make sure that that's not like all happening from the, the external rotation, if we can make sure the scapula is able to clear the way, the thoracic extension is able to clear the way, what you actually see is in a lot of cases you can clear up different like shoulder impingement type issues because now you're allowing the shoulder to stay centrated in, in the joint, in the socket. And so all that demand for the layback isn't just like, this is all locked down and we're just like cranking on our shoulder. It's like, no, you've freed up the pec, you're allowing the scap to actually tilt and work, you've freed up the T-spine. And now the arm can just like cleanly lay back versus this all just being like glued down, not working. The ball's still laying you back, but now you're in a position where all that range is happening at the shoulder. So I would argue this is actually a way to improve shoulder health. Um, we can talk about the, the different mobility aspects on a later question, but just from that standpoint, like those are the components that go into it. And I would definitely say that just cause we're, we're making the distinction between like total layback and external rotation of which you see 180 degrees, 200 degrees, like 170, that's not all happening at the shoulder. Maybe 100, 110, 120, 130 is, but it's these other contributions that we can really have a direct influence on. Next one, uh, a guy who's outside 90 degrees or he's dragging his arm. So, um, you know, I would define this as someone who's, you know, ideally a flexion around 90 degrees, maybe he's at 100, maybe he's at 75, but that's the guy who's like way outside and he's, when we call it, we call it arm drag, it's like he's now no longer out in that plane of rotation because as he goes to rotate, the ball is kind of lagging behind. So that, that's kind of an arm drag um, phenomenon. One of the things I observe with these guys, one, there's likely an, in, like, I'm not sure we can prove that yet, likely an increased injury risk for the UCL just with the, the structure of, of the elbow joint in terms of like being in that more open pack position, just dragging on the arm. There's likely some degree of injury risk there. Um, there's likely some nerve related risk too, because now like we're essentially just like, and you mentioned this in your own experience, like you're just tractioning these nerves that run from your, your cervical spine all the way down your arm. And now you're in this like almost like nerve tensioning position. So there's risk of nerve stuff. Um, but for me, the main thing is like, you're not in a position to maximally get that ball into the plane of rotation. So I actually like heavy, heavier balls for patterning here. I find that heavier balls tend to bring that ball, the natural tendency is to bring the ball closer to the axis of rotation. So if a guy's really dragging out here, you put a one pound, two pound ball in his hand, or maybe you just start with like a one pound ball, you start to find like, this feels terrible when he's just dragging from back here, his arm starts to find a little bit of a more flexed position. So for me, it's heavy balls, but not so heavy that I see him start to just like muscle up and lead with the elbow. There's a sweet spot there. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where like the art of coaching comes into play and what a guy's doing with that. And like you said, like the heavy implement, yeah, that's going to get us into a little bit better position. And ultimately, again, talking about the last piece in the chain, it's always, almost always gonna be the thing that happens before. And like you said, with the pulling out, you know, whether there might be some cervical issue where it's like they're getting the rotation, maybe they get caught and so they drag the arm with it. Um, but one thing that I'm always looking for with especially guys who say, you know, what do you, what do you feel when you throw? And they say, oh, I feel like I'm grabbing from behind, right? Because I feel like that's a pretty common cue of like guys will say, okay, I'm, I'm throwing from behind, right? Getting that, like you said, that stretch through here. Um, I've seen that kind of misinterpreted sometimes where some guys are like, okay, I'm throwing from behind. And it's like a reach out and then pull through where you talked about like getting away from your body with that arm. Whereas like, we know that, you know, that throwing from behind with that stretch in the back that we're talking about and making sure that, you know, we're doing something to help them feel, okay, throwing behind, we're not, we're not reaching and then pulling. We're letting that arm flip up naturally, rotate through into plane and make the throw out in front. And it's where, where is that stretch coming from? Because you can get beginning a stretch through like the anterior capsule 
a stretch like from dumping into the front of the shoulder. You can maybe be feeling a stretch through the bicep if you're way out here, a stretch through the radial nerve. Um, so it's also not just like, oh, I feel stretched somewhere, therefore I'm throwing well. It's like, no, where are you feeling the stretch? Let's make sure you're like, like your joint is not, is like actually centered and you're not just like ripping into super dangerous positions and feeling like an anterior capsule stretch or feeling like, you know, tingling down your bicep um, or tingling in the top of your forearm, like just yanking on the radial nerve. Um, I think that's important. You got, just real quick, this just reminded me, like there's a little bit more attention uh, being put back on like, throwing javelin, like javelins in training, uh, in training with uh, uh, Yoshinobu and his like javelin stuff. For me, I obviously see examples of like this having worked for certain guys and they can go and throw like this and then they pick up a ball and it's like, it's great. But I've also, I, like, I'm just very nervous to recommend that to guys who are, especially if they're already in a good spot because I see this like, like that is not a position you want guys to be in at landing from a baseball standpoint. For javelin, you have to be because of the nature of the implement. But does that make you guys nervous too? Have you played with the javelin stuff? Do you see guys actually like exaggerating this like supinated extended position and then they pick up a ball and they're completely fine? Or are you worried about that leading to that dragging phenomenon? Well, I think the key, the key phrase I picked up out of there for you were if they're in a good spot. Right. Like I absolutely agree if someone's in a good spot, no, I'm not going to throw a javelin at their feet and ask them to, you know, go to the yard. I think that javelin has its implements, as do many things that you see that probably get a lot of clicks on Instagram or something like that, where it's like, this is, we're talking about option four, five, six, seven, eight with some of these things that are getting people to, you know, get to good positions during the throw. And that's what I'm saying with what you said, if they're in a good spot, like if we see an arm action that's clean through and we're going through and we're working through these things and they all look good, check the box, check the box, check the box. By no means do I think throwing a javelin at them at any point in training is probably the best move because why, why would we try to change something that we currently like? I think javelin has its place as you've worked through the options that you know, you know and now you're, you're on that maybe four, five, six option trying to get some different feels from something that can be similar in some ways to a baseball throw. I think there's tons of different things like that. I know, you know, here we see a lot of guys sometimes going through tennis serves just to feel something with the arm. Um, javelin can be the same way, but like I said, I think, I think that's on a little bit lower in the list when you're trying to find a new thing to fix a guy's arm action specifically or just the way they move through the throw. Yeah, so my take on like the jab stuff is like, it, I guess it all revolves around like the application of like what you're trying to accomplish. I personally love how they train in terms of like the weight room side of things, the track and field standpoint. Um, I think understanding like the principles of the throw too. I love looking at javelin throwers just for, for like inspiration on just seeing how other guys are throwing an implement that's different than a baseball itself. In terms of what I give a guy like, hey, go to the field and throw a javelin to fix your throwing mechanics, I'm not going that direction. It's more along the lines of like understanding like, hey, like if we look at veteran, like what he's doing, it's like I'm seeing like, He's an absolute beast. He's mobile. He's strong through multiple ranges of motion. He transfers energy extremely well. He blocks well, like he's creating separation. It's just a different, it's basically just like the skill is different. The actual skill of throwing the implement is different. But I think from a baseball standpoint, we absolutely can take a lot of what they do and have application to what, how we train guys. Um, at the end of the day, like, you know, throwing is throwing. It's just, you're doing it in a different way, in a different skill, whether you're throwing a football, you know, a, a disc, like, you're gonna, there's aspects of energy transfer happening in every single skill. It's just the actual, like, I'm not giving a guy a jab and expect his arm action on a baseball downhill on a slope to get better. I personally have a drill that I give guys called jab drill, but it's basically just like a modified step in roll in that's abbreviated just to feel like the aspect of like relaxation. And when the front foot lands, they're able to like feel that kind of wave get sent up. It's just an over, but it's not preset outside 90. We're at 90 where you would typically be. It's kind of like a long toss throw. These are for guys that were like myself who maybe are downhill, who tend to be a little bit more dumpy this way. It's just like an over, it's just a feel that I do maybe for eight throws at the start of a session where it's just like feeling the arm relax, go here, and then just feeling like that impulse go up to like energy transfer standpoint. But actually throwing the implement of a javelin going outside, I am not going to give it to guys. Because I just don't see, I think like the, the gain you get from it, like it would just take away from 
really good training economy that we could have doing like a 10 toes or a pivot, for example. Like that's probably an area that we'd go rather than making them spend so much time trying to get better at learning a jab, in my opinion. That's, 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 that's also, also my concern, concern but again, you know, haven't been, I've been hesitant to implement it, but at the same time, like if we come back in five years and this doesn't, it doesn't age well, and it's like now we're, we've seen there's some amazing benefit, like certainly open-minded to, to these things, but that, again, this, this would be my yeah. concern. Like the principles are great. I, I really do enjoy how they train. It's just yeah, that's, the actual implement. That's exactly what I agree with you. And I was like, as coaches, we're looking at tons of stuff, especially rotation driven athletes and things like that. And like the way they train, some of the things they do, some of the patterns they hit are awesome. But you know, this being about the arm action, like, and like you said, and like I was saying, in a vacuum for the arm action, are we going out and doing javelin currently? Not right now. I mean, especially because just looking at the javelin as a skill is like a little bit more open. They're a little bit more straight with the block. Like they're going to be creating separation from a different spot rather than we're downhill. Like we're creating it just from a different plane, working in different planes down there up on flat ground. We're down on a slope. Like there's some different implications. Yep. All right. What about uh, having too much elbow flexion inside 90 and climbing and pushing? So I guess define this as at landing. That's the guy that's not just like 75 degrees of elbow flexion, but like way inside, like hand to the ear, Bartolo Cologne. And then from there, typically what you know we'll observe is when a guy gets super far in here, it's actually pretty tough for him to spiral out and around nicely. What usually happens is the elbow starts to lead the way. And so instead of the torso leading the way, again, pelvis, torso, arm laying back, it ends up being like elbow starts to climb. And now if you look at them at like peak layback, you look at that position, like instead of, instead of the, the camera's right here, demo like this, instead of hitting peak layback with the elbow like behind the ear, behind the nose, you look at it from the side and the elbow is now the thing leading the way. You'll see the elbow way out in front of the nose. From a back view, you'll typically see the elbow above plant of the shoulders. So if the shoulder rotation is here, you'll see the elbow in front and above that plane of rotation. But typically you'll see that start at landing or even before landing, you see it start with like bicep become overactive, bicep pulls the hand into too much elbow flexion. Again, this is, I wanna give this question to you because that's been your issue for like the past five plus years. Yeah. Bicep takes over too far inside 90 degrees of elbow flexion, elbow climbs, elbow pushes out front. And now what's your accelerator? You're not getting that pull into ball release. You have no option but to use your tricep as your main accelerator, your tricep Again, not as powerful of an accelerator as truly turning your arm into a whip. Right. So first off, do you agree with that summary of, you know, the elbow flexion leading to the climbing and pushing? And what have you found to be the biggest benefit, not just for you, but for other guys that have that issue? Yeah, no, absolutely. So like, like Ben mentioned, is like I've been dealing with this since I was 16 years old, um, you know, working on where the arm is. It's always been inside. Like the thing that people, when they see me, you know, throw with the botched arm match and they're always pointing out like, dude, you're so inside 90, you're so climby. Like in the landing, I'm literally, at, when I was in high school, my senior year, like there's videos of me like legit like this. And it makes sense why, like when I'm rotating, the arm's spiraling like up that direction. Like if I'm trying to throw it there, like why I would be selling pitches and stuff. What really kind of boiled down to, and like, I'm gonna try and keep this relatively short because I could just go on and on about what I've done these last six years, is just like understanding that and going leading back to our very first point of the question is just like, everything was affecting where my arm had to go. Like, it was just this matter of first, like me, I was very big on just pushing off the rubber as hard as I possibly could. I was a firm believer that like, if I was struggling bad in game when I was 16, 17 years old, I'm like, oh, I just gotta push harder. I gotta push harder, create more force, like directionally, like towards the, the catcher. And I became this very linear thrower in terms of like dumping to the left side, very elbow driven, very just like pushy with the arm. Um, you know, I had the curveballs that were the 100% spin efficiency that just popped out super slow. And there really wasn't any like stacked moment in my delivery whatsoever. It was just this giant tilt, extreme tilt. And I think like breaking down each piece, when I first started working with Cohen, like we kind of looked and did a breakdown of like, hey, this it's anything kind of by your arm right now. Everything else is going wrong in the delivery. Like out of leg lift, I remember getting a breakdown from him back in 2018. It was like out of leg lift, like I was overly stuck on this back leg. I ended up like pushing and like disengaging off that back hip. I lost this early. So when I'm in this position, 
like going back to where we're looking for with like the stack posture, all this stuff is like, I just got super extended super early. And then the only place, like I got to find rotation somewhere. So where was I finding it? With my head and my glove arm, I just ended up, and the example I like to use is like, you know, we're always looking at like how the glove arm is kind of influencing the throwing arm. And like, there's different ways, like, for me, the example I like to use is like if an ice skater was on an ice rink and like they bring their hands in, like it's gonna speed up rotation. Well, since I had no rotation actually coming from the pelvis and I was super extended, I just ended up finding it. My arm was already like here by going and I was like super downhill, super early. And then the only thing I really could do now was push into ball release. So it started from really hammering home, like, hey, learning that I don't have to have this giant push off the back hip. I didn't have the back hip underneath me. So I learned how to actually hinge or load better down the mound. It started with this. And then that ultimately just learning how to shift the center, put my torso in a relatively neutral spot. And then there's a little fuzz, but in a relatively neutral spot. So then from this position, now I actually kept the torso stacked. Right. So then the arm was able to kind of just work in a better spot here to then go and unwind and release. So, and don't get me wrong, it's not perfect by any means now, um, but now it's actually allowing the arm to be a little bit more level. Um, you know, I went down the, the rabbit hole of a lot of abbreviated stuff, just feeling kind of like the arm be here in this position, learning how to rotate from a stacked torso. And this kind of gets into another topic of like why abbreviated arm action drills, like who would you give those to? But for me, it wasn't anything to do with like trying to fix my arm. It was ultimately learning, like if I just kept my arm in the spot that I know I want it to be into landing and I've thrown 95.4 out of the little step in with the abbreviated arm is like, for me in this position, I was able to actually feel the pelvis, the torso stay stacked and let these pieces work. And this was just kind of just chilling where it needed to be. So then from this position, now I can actually send that energy up from the lower half to the upper half. And now where I'm at today, you know, summarizing it within how long it's been is like trying to learn how to feel the takeaway phase, like work how it would out of this feeling where this needs to be at the right time to then be able to send that energy up is kind of the approach I've taken so far. I think that's a, a great point in, in terms of realizing that for you, it was actually the lower half that was creating the compensation, screwing it up. And even now, like watching you when, you, when you're doing like drills that don't involve the lower half, like when you're just sitting there doing arm action drills or whatever, like you don't have that climb at all. Like arm is perfect. Right. And then it starts to creep a little bit in once you, once you add back in the lower half yep. to some extent. So just recognizing problem solving, like if, if you're a guy who like really gets, really pulls hard in here, but like you can do it perfectly fine, a pivot pick off, a two knee throw, a 10 toes. And then it's only when you add in the lower half and then something is pulling you open, pulling you, right. and you notice it's only happening like when you add in hip rotation or when you add in the leg lift, it's like, that's a clue. Yeah. You can see the whole sequence. It's why when like, you know, I want, I want to see a video of my guy's mechanics. I want to know their metrics. I want to know how their command was. I want to know all these things. But specifically when we're looking at mechanics, like I want to see their whole drill progression for that day. Shoot me like a couple throws of each thing. So I know now like in the game or in the bullpen, he's pulling open. I want to see, well, were you pulling open on yeah. your warm-up throws? Were you pulling open on the rocker throw? Were you pulling open on the arm action throw? Like, and usually you can figure out where the disconnect is happening. Absolutely. And so it's a huge clue that for someone that doesn't have, you know, so that doesn't take them eight years to figure this out, like in your case, um, it's just a huge clue to, to look for. It's yeah. like, is this always here? Okay, maybe it's a mobility issue. Or is this show up like when you add in this piece of the throw, boom, that's, that's your clue right there, is that's throwing everything off. Yeah, and I think what you said about how you like to get videos from guys, same exact way, and I, I know you're the same way too, where a lot of times the athlete, um, or really when you're looking at your own mechanics, you want to hyper-focus on what you're doing in-game. You know, you get in-game mechanics from guys all the time. But it's like, you know, you, you, you beg for, hey, send me that progression that led you here. Because the answer is going to be in that, you know, the conscious implementation on the ply wall so we can have subconscious patterns when we get to the mound. And that's what I always stress, and it sounds like you're the same, where it's like, I want to see what leads to this. Because we can, we can sit and, you know, get a video of a high school thrower and go for 30 minutes completely tearing them down, everything that we do. That does something for him to, he knows what he's doing wrong. But then we go through and you have to look at those drills that led him up to this point and pick and choose where you can make those changes. Yeah, or is it perfect in the bullpen and then it's only when he gets a batter in the box or only when yeah. you know, he throws on a game mound that everything like starts to 
tense up. And like, so you'll, you'll see some examples where like mechanics don't happen in isolation. Arm action doesn't happen in isolation from the rest of the mechanics, but then the overall mechanics don't happen in isolation from like the mental side. Yeah. And so you'll, you'll see some examples where it's like, oh no, he actually was, the mound was crappy. Like in game, the mechanics like fell apart, but it was fine in the bullpen. It was fine in all his drill work. And then it's like, okay, cool. So there's, there's something about going on the game mound, about the hitter, about the umpire, about the pressure of the situation, about trying, like you got to a 3-0 count and now you're trying to throw a, like land a fastball and so you tense up like everything. So you have to look at the overall context of it. It's not, mechanics are also aren't in a vacuum. It's like, there's the mental side. There's, there's a lot that goes into like the motor learning standpoint. Um, I'll just add to, to the inside 90 thing, like ball weights, certainly like a big factor, especially guys that are, um, you know, throwing, like we don't do it. Some guys still prefer to like throw the four pound, like if you're using like the black plyo ball or other four pound ball or wrist heavy wrist weights, like there's certain guys that like have a reason for doing that. But like more times than not, you see guys are just like coached to throw an implement that's like too heavy. It brings the ball closer into the, the axis of rotation. Again, maybe you want some of that if they're out here, you want a heavier ball to bring them a little closer in. But if a guy's already in here, it's like, if you take the, you exaggerate it, like, hey, I want you to throw a 20 pound dumbbell, like 20 feet, what are you going to do? You're not going to like swing it up on time, relax and whip it. Like, no, you're going to get it up here and then you're going to catapult it. Yeah. It's the same fundamental thing that happens with a four pound ball. Like it's just varying degrees on that spectrum, but guys end up bringing it super close and they end up catapulting it as opposed to actually relaxing and whipping it. And so you can kind of figure out along that spectrum of ball weights. Like we don't have to only throw a five ounce ball, obviously some guys prefer to, but you get two, you get too heavy, you start to see that pattern start to creep in, the elbow climb. And so for me, I, I don't have any of my guys throw black plyo unless there's like some, unless they can really justify like why they need to be doing it and show me a video of them doing it like without muscling up. I've seen it once and it wasn't one of my guys, it wasn't even a baseball player. It was Johannes Vetter, Olympic javelin thrower, dudes like an absolute tank, like benches 400 plus pounds, like, I mean, so, and this is a guy who's built up to those types of loads to where like his shoulder doesn't just like freak out going into layback with a four pound ball. Um, and so he's built up to that over time. And so it's him doing like drills into a wall, four pound ball. And you're like, holy crap. He's like, he's not guarding at all. He's letting his arm whip. It's like, great. That's the only time I've seen that personally. I'm sure there's been a couple other examples, but so I'm like super careful with going over a one pound ball in terms of any drill work, just knowing that the body starts to want to bring go a little too far in and guards itself to protect itself. Um, let's talk about uh, a late late arm action. So, Leif, if you want to kind of describe what we, what where would we classify late versus like on time, and then give us like one thing you guys can work on. Yeah. So basically, you're looking at late like. There's many ways you can be late. I'd say the two big ones are going to be, you know, we're seeing like maybe palm down or you're still, you know, in a pronated position, shoulders internally rotate a little bit as you go into foot strike. We consider that late. And then also we consider late, maybe you're flipped up perfectly. You're, you're even more than flipped up here, but you're well outside of 90 degrees. Like that's another, that's another box we check or say, okay, that's late. So those two things and how do we fix those? Like we said, we're talking about the last piece in the chain. So a lot of times we're going to be looking at that torso, making sure that that's in a good position. Like I said, for me, it's going to start out of leg lift. Like I like to put myself into some flexion that I can let myself flip up into and then get into extension. Um, that's the first place we're going to start. But looking at the arm just strictly in a vacuum, like if we were to take and do some sort of drill for a super just upper half constraint, um, going to those drills like a Rose like to do in the past where he's, you know, starting in these and feeling what it's like to have that arm in a good position that he can flip up into. And then patterning that by, you know, doing some testing out of it. Like he said, he had the 95, four out of that and learning, okay, this is how my body operates. When I perform a drill and constraint, you go back, maybe look at the video, get some feedback from your coach, whatever it is and say, yes, I'm hitting these positions. Well, that's that conscious implementation during catch play, during testing, that then you're hoping is a subconscious pattern that forms on the mound based on those reps that you're getting in those positions. Um, but like we said throughout this entire podcast, I think the theme has been, yes, arm action matters, but it's going to be what leads up to that pattern that's creating a lot of times what's visually, you know, unappealing in the arm. What do you got for late arm action? 
to continue like the broken record thing is just like I think late in my opinion late is all relative to like what the pelvis and where it is the positioning of that like you'll I see a lot of guys just land and like they might be like late but like okay why is the arm down like and then we look a little bit more downstream and the pelvis is actually like not actually rotated and getting open and so then it's just trying to buy time to actually like create a little bit of resistance to work into because if i was here and my pelvis was still closed in this position i was already flipped up when i go to rotate what happens like this is going to be completely open and i'm going to end up getting pushy with the arm so it's just one of those things of just like taking the whole approach of looking downstream why is this arm doing what it, it's is it late like it's all relative but like if i'm here in the landing but then when that hip turns and like oh you have a late arm but then the hip turns and i catch it and i'm able to go and the velocity is good i don't think that's late i just think it's a everybody i think thinks like oh i need to be up but then there's like plenty of big leaguers if you look that are all within this like little bit of a window here and you know the guys that are down here like, yeah, maybe you go and give them abbreviated stuff or you learn how to time that up. But it, typically, I think something's going on down here to make them want to try and like delay it just for a split second longer. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, understanding like, it, like, is it is it actually like a late arm or is it like an early trunk, early pelvis? Because right. your arm could be like doing its thing, like on a perfectly good path. But then because you early with the torso now relative to that it looks late but like no it was it was going to get up on time if you had a, if you had been able to keep everything else timed up close like you would have been on time but because the torso and the pelvis went early now you look late or does that all like seem to work really well but then the arm despite that is still right. late. so is it a late arm or an early torso right. early pelvis um, for me i want to understand mobility as well because some of the time some of the actual like the late arm action could be like, no, he doesn't actually have the, the range of motion to like be in this kind of closed off position and actually get the arm up. So that's where like the movement screen, you know, go, comes into play. Like we have, a, we have a field goal test where it's literally like not, arms at 90 degrees, full retraction. Can you turn your head clear cervical rotation both ways? Like if a guy can do that, passes that test, like, okay, we know he has the range to like get into some of these positions, at least from, from the upper body. If he doesn't, like, there's a whole mobility sequence we need to go through, address the pec, address, you know, coracobrachialis, address the lat. Like, there's, there's a whole other sequence of things, conversation. Um, for me, before I start, like, cueing them a bunch or giving them, like, abbreviated stuff, um, I prefer to, like, if we can do something that has no risk of doming them up, like, that to me is ideal. Um, so more, like, external type things. So I really like tennis racket uh, drill for that which you can just give them a tennis racket or imagine you're holding a tennis racket, but like you have to serve a ball with your hands starting together instead of like serving it like this. Like imagine you're trying to hit a ball up here, but hands start together, hold a tennis racket, and they're gonna do something like that. And they're like, wait a second, I felt totally different. All, all you've given, give, if you've given them a different implement and like a slightly different like task constraint. And a lot of times that just like cleans it up and they're like, oh, I get it, but you didn't have to like blend a whole bunch of like abbreviated stuff. If that doesn't work, um, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, to catch with a football for some guys, like it, it'll bring them a little bit closer, get them on time. And like they have, they're not down here throwing a football. Suddenly they like understand like how to time up the front foot, time up the rotation with just giving them a little bit of a, again, heavier implement, but just a different constraint without like risking yipping them up. Um, and then also like time constraint stuff. So if they're super late, I'll also be trying things like a quick pick, like, hey, start, start in a quick pick position, throw, does that work? Maybe like a half kneeling quick pick, maybe like turn and burns, like add, add a little bit of time constraint. Ground balls, like field, field of backhand, fire and throw, does that get it on time? Or like in every single scenario, like that guy's just late, that guy's just late. And then you kind of have to go back to the drawing board. You might have to like put them in more abbreviated positions. Yeah. And I think it's important to know too with some of the things that I'll see, you know, on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, with a lot of guys doing maybe a still frame of somebody throwing and let's say the arm's in a bad position. This is where I think the argument of what is front foot strike comes into play, especially when you're dealing with maybe an iPhone recording that was in, taken in, um, you know, a, a smaller frame rate. Yeah, like a 30. Um, and so like you get a guy that maybe in the video, it looks like the foot is down and he's here. And then next frame, 
or here and there's some weight bearing on the front foot. In my opinion, it's really important that you kind of make the difference between weight bearing front foot strike and just yeah the when is it like just tap down and when is there actually like exactly weight acceptance and yeah. that's gonna that's gonna be a huge hugely different for some guys in yes. terms of like is the arm late like yeah. you might think he's late but then he's actually like the next frame he's perfectly on time he's still close he's still like in a good spot because i know we've all seen a lot of you know still frames right. of an arm completely down and it could be simply because of how the video was recorded that that is really their toe is maybe barely touching the ground and the difference between especially if you have an arm that flips up very quickly like aero said like we're a lot of times we're not even looking at big league guys that are like straight flipped up like they're somewhere in the middle so the difference between this facing down and being at the toe versus in the front foot strike and you're in actually a great position i think that's important to know when you're looking over film um and especially maybe if you have somebody you know, send you a picture of you throwing or something like that. Just discerning, okay, front foot strike is not when my toe or heel or whatever touches the ground. Like it's when I am initiating force into that front side. All right, last flaw. Uh, let's talk about glove arm. The glove arm, just generally speaking, like glove arm pulling open, super common issue. Uh, probably half the guys watching this have dealt with uh, kind of leaking or flying glove arm at some point. Um, one of the things I look for is not just like the direction that the glove arm takes into rotation, but also like how early do we get supinated. So if you have, if you're a guy who like immediately you see them like turn over, you kind of know, like we talked about like holding some degree of like internal tension or internal rotation tension on the glove side. Um, you immediately see a guy who pulls open supination. You're going to typically see that lead to a swimming action. Um, you might not see that, but they still swim into rotation. So um, what are you guys looking for on the glove arm when you see that flying open? Yeah, I mean, same with the arm action. I'm looking for some fluidity. I'm looking for, you know, a mechanism that allows you to keep yourself in some flexion, whether you want to talk about, you know, tensioning the obliques, whatever you want to talk about in that sense. But I'm looking for something that allows them to create momentum into rotation. Like Avery was saying when he's looking at figure skaters, like anything rotational, shot putting, javelin, whatever you can look at, you're looking, you know, something get away from your body and then in through the body. And how does the arm action help you or how does it impede you from rotating as quickly as you can into, you know, a line that you're eventually going to get to, to your target? What do you think about, um, Real quick, because I know there's there's some coaches who would, you know, there's some coaches who would like teach the whole positive disconnection thing where they like they like want like a ton of like separation here, and then there's other coaches who, um, you know, they're they're trying to teach more like stabilize out in front, like don't actually allow this to create any sort of like scap retraction. It's like get it out in front, and then just like bring everything to the glove. Like we all know who we're talking about here when we're ta or who teaches that. But what would you say to like, what are we ideally trying to see? Like, we're obviously not trying to just see like that. Like everyone knows, like, that's not ideal. But my opinion, at least, like you look at the hardest stories, you look at a Rawls Chapman, you look at guys like this, like they're also not just like, they're not following through and just like bringing their chest to their glove. There's some aspect of like, at least the way I, I kind of think of it is like, there's, there's a tension aspect. There's some aspect of working in opposition. It's not just like throwing arms here and like this arm's like down here or like up here. Like there's some aspect of, working in opposition for the vast majority, not perfectly equal and opposite, but like they're working against each other to some extent. But then I think of it as almost like, because you're holding tension, the figure eight analogy or uh, infinity loop, it's like this is screwing you down into landing and helping deliver the upper half as opposed to screwing you open. It's screwing you down into landing, but there's still some aspect of scap retraction. It's not just like you're out here there's still screwing in and you see that of all Chapman pictures where he's way back here, but it's not that direction. It's screwing into the plane of rotation. 
Yeah, my like my whole thing with the glove arm is like I do think it's very very important just like in the grand scheme of just like you know learning how to rotate for the guys I'll just kind of start just like for the guys that maybe will take the the path of like the blocking where it's like if you have a glove arm that goes out and then you're just training the torso to kind of just block out in front what's really happening is like since this left side really doesn't actually get retracted you're not you're missing out on a giant load that you can get through the entire sling where it's basically just like you're gonna be like blocking this and then I, I see guys that are just going to get pulled open early and they have those very overly linear deliveries so i would say like for those guys that think they need to block you're really missing out on a lot of rotational just angular velocities with the torso that do have a high correlation to ball velocity it's like you're going to miss out on a lot of that rotational just components that you get in the torso which i think is very very important so like there is an aspect of like getting loaded like this side here like if let's just do get into like a stride like if my arm's here let's say i'm in retraction but i just block i really don't have much of a load but if i kind of go and clear you're actually when the scaps get behind you the t-spine wants to extend and load so you're going to get that component of like loading the spine to unload you're actually going to create that wave effect rather than just like this very overly linear kind of dart push that you would get There's a sweet spot between like overly rotational and that's that's the guy who's he's maybe getting back here but it's it's pulling him way off versus pulling him into into the target versus overly linear where it's all just very like careful like linear dart throwing positions forward flexing and there's you never actually access the rotation there's like relatively few guys that have made a big league career yeah. throwing that way and the example that i like to use like and this is something that i found and i've actually given it to a lot of athletes and they're like oh that that makes sense where it's like if i'm moving controlling the center down the mound and i'm like staying sideways as long as i can like when i'm in this position and like my arm starts to go into flip up and I start to rotate, it's kind of like the glove arm naturally is gonna kind of get out of the way if you do it right to get in the right position. So now I have a fixed point here. A lot of people talk about the lead leg being the fixed point to rotate, to rotate into. I do think that's very important, but like the glove arm acts as that for the torso too, like where the pelvis is gonna decel here and I can speed up, this is gonna get out the way. So now my torso is gonna be able to accelerate to get into that forward shoulder rotation. And like I tell guys like, hey, you're so worried about flying open, flying open, flying open. Like I want you to get into a stride, like be sideways as long as you can. What is, was your glove arm gonna wanna do this? Like if my hips are sideways, like I don't think our body wants to turn this direction, like really stemming looking down, like if this, pelvis just opens up early, yeah, you're gonna want to kind of swing open to get something to the arm. But like if I stay sideways and I actually have a really good linear move down the mound, staying loaded, holding this position, it's like, I don't, you're not really gonna like wanna just pull this in front of that left hip, if that makes sense. For, for me, I, I completely agree. I almost never coach or cue the glove arm in any of my guys. You might disagree in certain, like, I know you might have certain scenarios, but for me, in most cases, when I see that, I see like, okay, that's a guy who doesn't understand how to create tension from here so and that was very much that was me all through high school like I was the guy who like just flew up and couldn't create any separation but ultimately it came down to like I was trying to get everything from here because I didn't actually understand how to hold tension hold closed so I, I didn't know I didn't have the tools to actually like stay sideways and hold closed from my back hip and from my pelvis if someone had just like gone back in time and told me stay sideways at like 15 years old and I could have just worked through that like I would have thrown 90 in high school instead of 84 I would have you know they just would have completely changed everything but for me like everything starts with the pelvis so if, if I see a glove arm like how do we how do we mimic that we can we can try to eliminate that from just like trying to keep this on the target we can try to eliminate it from holding torso closed or we can try to eliminate it from the pelvis for me I would typically start with the pelvis for guys and if they can do that if they can hold this as long as possible like the glove arm doesn't really have any ability to get here because like if you hold this it controls everything else up the chain yeah and if i am doing cueing and i'm sure you can kind of dive in on this a little bit is like if i am cueing glove arm it's really more so like the posture out of handbrake like where's the direction it's taking like are you a guy who breaks and you're like this and then that swims up are you a guy who like maybe overly supinates out like it's usually if i'm talking about glove arm especially in just like constraints like can we focus on just like the direction of like is this helping assist this to stay stacked or is this kind of being in the right spot? So then when this does its job, you know, the spine and the pelvis, it's gonna want to clear and work to kind of like flow into the throat. That's kind of my take on when I am cueing it. It's more so like, hey, if we can get to the right spot and then this rotates, 
it will get out the way to allow us to load and unload. That's just yeah. kind of how I think about it. Glove arm thoughts? Yeah, I think that in general, like what you're saying with the back hip and how that puts you into a good position for the glove side, like can't work out through, um, completely agree with that. And for some cases that I've seen, the glove side is actually gonna work in the opposite effect to put you into that good position that you get through. And the way that I have used cueing in particular, um, something that, you know, by no means did I create, but something that I guess has been conceptualized before, but basically using the thumb, using your glove to beat your elbow past like the midline, like basically the middle of your body here. And that feeling of this um, kind of double dipping on, you know, rotation that you can create with your glove side without doing this, like what Avro was saying with the arm pumping out. And I think your representation of it was good where you're saying, okay, I'm feeling this move here, right? Instead of this fly out early, something like that. Like the favorite. Basically like getting, getting the thumb <clears throat> here. Yeah. To and, feel some tension. Yeah. And it's not just, it's to not delay, just. To delay the, the turning over into supination. Mm -hmm. Try to delay that as long as you can. Yeah. And it's not just like, I can do that. I can go super ribs flared and just internally rotate my shoulder. And then that's also not it. Like this is, this is a structure of keeping myself down here, using this to speed up into my glove side turning over. Um, and so that's the thing where it's like, don't hyper focus on just, okay, I want my glove side. I want the thumb to beat myself back this way, because if you're here, that's also, we're also not in a good position, but how can you use the glove side to get your body into a better position to get the arm up and then deliver it forward? That's where I've used the cue of glove side beats the elbow past the middle of your body when, you know, you're side facing. Have you found that like two knee long toss or two knee throws or like 10 toes or like those types of things clean up the, you know, clean up the relationship between the two kind of on their own. Like I've seen that with a couple of guys. Yeah, I think you, you need you take to. this out of it. You just like, like you literally get them here and like have them throw. And it's like, suddenly it, like the guy with just like the dead fish, like glove arm is like, well, I literally can't, I've taken this out of the equation. Like the only way I can actually create any like tension here, or any velocity is to like actually create some tension through here. Like actually learn to get this and this, because now we've taken out the back, like the back side. So, the two knee throw is almost like a constraint to, to teach how these work in opposition. It doesn't have to be two knees. I mean, it can be a 10 toes throw, but you're, you're like for the guy that has like the complete, just like dead fish front arm, like that can be a way to like, like there's no way to produce like something to pull against unless you learn to use your glove side that way. And then there's, there's not necessarily the risk of like yipping the guy up where he's like thinking about everything the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, I mean, again, the art of coaching is like, what point of the season are you at? How much, how much conscious implementation do you have in this moment in the season? Like, are we, are we going for with the guy that's headed to spring training and asking him to, you know, cue his glove side? No. But is it something that early in the off season we can work through with the guy? And then, like you said, maybe progressing through a 10 toe and try to see some change that he can get repetitions in during the off season with how many ever thousands of throws you're going to make and then subconsciously come in for your you know, bullpen when you're leaving for spring training and have it just happen where you don't have to think about it. It's just putting you in a better position you're working through. All right, we're gonna skip over a couple of the topics we had planned because we could, we could talk yeah. all day, but um, I think we, we, have to, we have to finish with two things. Um, one is the short, act, short arm action versus long arm action discussion. Um, I think we've seen the pendulum kind of swing super far towards like everyone's chasing like the Joe Kelly, um, you know, short arm action type thing, maybe five years ago, I think it's maybe swung back a little bit. Um, but where do you guys fall on this like short arm action? Like everyone should just be like super short compact versus longer arm action. Um, how do we know what's right for a certain guy? Should everyone be like, you know, throwing from their, you know, belt buckle and just like super short and compact? Um, is that just like a motor preference thing? Where do you guys fall on the long versus short arm action debate? I see. Oh, you want to go? I'll go. My answer's a little shorter. So I'll just, I'll, I was just going to say, I think it's, it's with everything, like whether we want to talk about, you know, hip internal rotation, external rotation, and really bucket guys. I think in terms of, if you look at high velocity, you know, very talented throwers, 
there's a spectrum, right? And it's going to be long and short on each side. And always, 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 there's going to be a hyper focus on the mega ends of the spectrum because it's cool. It's cool to see somebody doing something differently that ends up in a high velocity throw. But you have to understand that the 95% is going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's where I'm more position based of what is your momentum of the arm? What is your action, whether it be short, long, what positions is it bringing you to at what time in the delivery? Go over and look at, you know, the 95 mile, 98 and up in the big leagues. You're going to see a lot of throws all over the spectrum, but you have to understand like there is a midpoint and you're probably going to be somewhere, you know, 40% of that midpoint rather than being the 5% guy that's going to, you know, just be super short or extremely big and long. I've seen the Joe Kelly short path throw 100. I've seen the Ubaldo Jimenez stab throw really upper 90s. I've seen the Madison Bumgarner throw mid 90s with the overly pronated. I guess it all just like, also the Bauer supinated just preset position. I've seen plenty like looking over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hard throwers. It's all come to the point of just like, what are the principles of a high velocity delivery? What are we trying to accomplish with the arm action? There's plenty of ways to get the job done. It's just a matter of like, hey, where are you at? Is what you're doing right now currently influencing those principles? If they are, maybe we make some changes towards that. If they aren't and you stab, but you time it up and you're able to funnel all the energy up into the arm action at the last segment, great. I'm probably not gonna bother trying to go into detail of changing an arm action. I think you, you go and you look at the guys who've had a lot of success like on record and it's, you know, it's guys like Joe Kelly, it's guys like Pete Fairbanks, who we, you know, we've gotten to know and, and work with a decent amount. I had my second Tommy John in August of 17. What I'm doing is not sustainable for health or for stuff. I was like, I think it's, it will be very much beneficial for me to change this. And I was like, my first example, right, was Joe Kelly. I was like, he threw like me big long arm swing, changed it and started ripping out 104s. Not that he didn't throw hard before, but it like jumped and was more consistent with that. Started there, started watching a ton of video. The biggest thing then was once I was cleared right on my rehab, I started doing med ball drills, just like catching here to shot, but just to feel that short stroke and go. Um, but those were guys, if you look at their mechanics before, they got super long, but in a way that actually limited their ability to get that ball into the plane of rotation. And so if you're super long and you know, you're just like not on time and dragging and like, I mean, Pete was still mid nineties with like completely off time, like long kind of stabby off time. And so for him, it was more of, I think the reason it worked so well is it was just a, a strategy. There was other ways he probably could have thrown a hundred, but it was a strategy to get himself like on time, like we talked about so that he could get the ball in the plane of rotation and everything works the way it needs to work. So for him, it wasn't, I don't think it's necessarily about like the fact that it was short. It's the fact that he found a strategy to get the ball on time get the arm in plane. And so for him that worked. Again, same with Joe Kelly. Like he, he threw hard with a longer arm swing too, but it was a more consistent way for him to get the ball, get the arm and the ball in the, in a right spot to actually capture that plane of rotation. So could there have been other strategies to do that? And still, you know, Pete's still throwing 100 with a little bit longer arm swing. Yeah, absolutely. But this, this clicked for him. It was one strategy that worked and like you would never change it now at this point. But at the same time, like I personally know tons of guys where, you know, they have an injury and some coach immediately says, well, you got hurt because you're longer. So we're going to just like only do short arm action stuff. They change what has made a guy successful. And now he's, he comes back, he's throwing five miles an hour slower than he used to. And he's out of baseball a year later. So for every like one success story, you know, on the back end, you see five or maybe even like 10 failure stories. Um, it's not to say we would have always fixed them with like a longer arm path or a different strategy, but it's very much like not uh, a guarantee or end all be all that like you shorten up a guy who's long and he's instantly gonna go have the success that like a Pete Fairbanks had. Uh, by the same token, like there are absolutely your guys who are like too long and you bring them in a little bit closer. Um, like Jameson Tyone comes to mind, a guy I've gotten to work with remotely for a few years. And he was always like the guy who he would communicate, like he'd feel his arm get like lost behind his body. Like he was so much mobility, like just get his arm like completely lost behind his body after his uh, second TJ, um, before he worked with us, he really took it upon himself to like get as short as he possibly could. And just like, we, yeah, I don't know if you remember the videos like of his rehab before the season that one year, but he was just like so short, I mean, to the extent that it was ruining his ability to transfer energy effectively, but he was like throwing 90, 92. 
Um, what I encouraged him was, was like, stop placing all the focus on your arm. Like, don't even worry about the arm. Like, because at that point he had come almost too far the opposite side of the pendulum. It's like, let's just let the arm slot in, do what it wants to do. Let's keep the focus on like good, efficient lower half, like attacking the zone, like transferring energy effectively. And like, he kind of found like a middle ground as opposed to like getting really lost behind his body, getting too tight. His body naturally found that middle ground. And so it's not something I will typically actively coach unless I feel like there's a very good reason to do so. 100%. Uh, let's talk about uh, cheating. And by cheating, I mean cheating metrics. Um, this is a super common issue. Um, you'll see it in a lot of different scenarios, but um, cheating vert and cheating sweep are probably the two most common that, I mean, if you have another, you want to cheating spin efficiency, cheating vert. And again, this was primarily over the past five years with TrackMan's becoming more commonplace with Rapsodo, like every, everyone having access to one of those two. And so what, I mean, Eric, do you want to just kind of explain what we, what you'll typically see with that, with guys like cheating fastball vert? Yeah. So like a lot of times I see guys like cheating fastball vert, we, we go back to talk about like what we're trying to do is match all the planes of rotation and the arm slot in at the very end, which you'll see with a lot of guys who maybe they have like a lower half that's a little bit more like rotating on this plane, torsos rotating on this plane. And then that last second, the arm will just kind of creep out and you'll see this kind of aggressive dart push where the arm kind of like climbs up out of slot. Like if you were kind of matching shoulder plane here and you would see a guy kind of wrapping around this direction, you might see them go here like they'll start good and then they'll just dart forward and kind of create this giant push to try and create more vert and with some guys you know and maybe they're having success and it's great and they're still throwing hard Colin Bush, yeah, maybe. right that might be something where it's like okay like it's okay but if you have a guy who's 88 he tries to achieve vert and he's actually cutting it very much so in supination he's just stuck and it just creates this very just like bad fastball that's a place where it's like kind of getting him hey maybe we're leaving a couple of ticks of miles per hour on the table a little bit just more efficient path of rotation then that's a guy where maybe i'm going to kind of introduce more like drills to work on being more on plane yeah just got to be careful if if your entire goal is like hey i need to make my fastball go from 15 inches of vertical break to 20 it's like almost an, even a sidearm guy can like cheat so that he it reads 20 by just getting to a high you know, high axis, right. cheating his his hand up, getting behind it. Like they're gonna be able to cheat to that. Like a lot of catchers fall in that scenario where like a lot of catchers will kind of like cheat their elbow up, but like they're able to get a really like true straight carrying throw, even though they could throw harder if they like let their arm actually slot into the plane of rotation. So, I mean, there's guys where it can work where you, you will maybe sacrifice a couple miles an hour to get that like kind of like carrying sneaky fastball. But there's also guys where, um, you know, maybe they, we have, uh, we had a guy who was like 97 and then he started getting really like coached in with his team to like chasing vert. He was throwing 99 two a year later. And it's like, you just get, you drop his arm back in plane back to 97. Yeah. Is his fastball vert 19 anymore? Or is it back to 15? It was 15, but he actually still had the ability to create the VAA, the approach angle. And he was, he was able to still get whiffs up in the zone because he was throwing 97 from here instead of like 91 from here, cheating that, cheating that vert. So that's just something to, to be aware of. If you're just you're a guy who's like throwing a pitch, immediately go look at the iPad. Oh crap, that was a bad one. It might not have been a bad one if you're only evaluating it from like this one metric. And it depends on the level you're at too. Like the high school kid that pro like maybe who throws 85 probably shouldn't be worried too much about trying to like create all this crazy vert. Like I would chase overall just your ability to move really efficiently, transfer energy, throw hard. Um, with the pro athletes, it's like maybe, you know, that is a separator of more whiffs in the zone and like actually being able, that helps him and it's good. But maybe, you know, if you cheat vert, your fastball velo drops a little bit. Now your off speed changes shape, it's slower and it's not as efficient. Like I'm, maybe that's a conversation where it's like, hey, we want you to throw harder, even though the fastball like metrics aren't as sexy, but like it makes your off speed better. Like then that's a conversation to have of like, hey, we do want you to try and chase more. And that that basically you have to peel back the layers and see the arsenal as a whole, see what you're willing to trade off, what is the trade off, and then build the arsenal off of that. Can you imagine if like, like Edwin Diaz was trying to like cheat fastball vert? Right. It's like, he's naturally just like so deceptive from here. Yeah. And it's 12, 13, 14 inches of vert, but it's from a low slot. So it's, he's just getting over barrels so easily from that point. Right. He could easily have a coach be like, man, you'd be so good if you had 20 inches of vert. And suddenly he's like up here and like his trunk is, his pelvis is rotating here. His trunk is rotating here. And now his arm is up here trying to cheat fastball vert. 
boom, now he throws 94 instead of 101 from here. Yeah. It's like, that would be such a mistake. And luckily it doesn't seem like that's happened to this point, but just being aware like fastball vert is not the end all be all, which takes into the next thing, the next common one, which is like the sweeper craze. Sweepers are also awesome, like an awesome pitch, like cool to watch, but like not everyone is set up in their delivery to throw a sweeper. Not everyone has the supination first off to throw a sweeper. Not everyone does it fit with their arsenal. And like, maybe they're a more North South guy, like Pete Fairbanks doesn't need to be throwing a sweeper most likely, I mean, maybe he will add one at some point. Um, but what you'll, what you'll see, and this happened to one of my guys, um, is he went to a new team and they immediately start teaching everyone a sweeper. This happened to one of your guys too, same organization. And he was actually naturally more of like an upright torso guy, higher glove side, higher arm slot, fastball vert guy, hard gyro slider. And so he was, he was creating these carry fastballs. He was creating that kind of more vertical gyro, like hard mid eighties. He's a lefty reliever and suddenly he gets taught the sweeper and they're telling him like only throw the sweeper, only throw the sweeper. Well, what happens? He's trying to cheat to get as much horizontal as possible because when he throws one that's 11 horizontal, they're like, that wasn't good. Okay, cool. I can, I can like cheat to make it go 20 inches of horizontal. So he starts cheating, he starts cheating and then suddenly now his fastball, it starts bleeding over into his fastball. His fastball was 94, 95, 18, 20 inches of vert here. Now his arm drops. Now his fastball is 14 inches of vert at 90, 91. Now they scrap his slider, which was his bread and butter his whole career. He was a high round pick, like top prospect type guy, like big league time, like had, had been having some success. And it just like derailed everything because now he's trying to cheat to get to that position to create max sweep, but it bleeds over into the rest of his arsenal. So you can't just like look at pitches in isolation. You have to look at like, is what we're doing to create that shape affecting the rest of the pitches and how they move too. But it's specifically will affect the arm action as well, because now that's a guy who's like more likely than not going to like cheat counter rotation yeah. and just flying out to like create as much sweep as possible. Absolutely. Have you seen that with any of your guys? Yeah, I think any just other cheating? Being, uh, being more aware of when it starts, like especially for kids that maybe don't have access to track man, because, you know, your training environment is going to be different, especially for a high school kid. Um, the big thing I see with like a high school kid, maybe he's a more north to south um, thrower and north to south arsenal in general, like you talk about like high ride and then maybe hard gyro something, maybe a little death ball down, something like that. Starting catch play and just messing around the grip that they saw online, something like that. And catch play partner gives really good feedback and I'm like, oh, that was nasty. That was huge. But in general, you were just dropping slot to then sweep across. And that bleeds into your other pitches and makes everything worse to throw a pitch that probably isn't going to grade out or have a lot of success for you anyways. Um, so that's where it's like, stay true to who you are, what, what you are doing the best, and just be okay with that. You know, just play up to, play up to your strengths. Final thing would be just be like for, you know, coaches or athletes watching this, like let's start with coaches. Like where would you, where would you start? What would you do with all this information that we've just kind of thrown at them? Um, do you have an opinion on like, again, we've, we've given them a ton of different flaws, ton of different like thoughts, their minds probably like, they have two pages of notes. They're like, I don't know what to do with all this information. Like, where would you start from a coach's standpoint? Should they go and like change everybody's arm path in their, on their team right now? Should they just sit on this information? Like, what should they do with this? Yeah, I think just like as a whole to summarize that like we talked about is like, we don't want to go too minute with everything. Kind of my whole take on this entire podcast has been to see the delivery as a whole for what it is, find the biggest buckets of the delivery that need to be filled. So I think it starts with just like educating of yourself of like, hey, what are all these guys doing in a high velocity delivery in terms of like the first piece of the chain, lower half, what's going on there? Where's the torso, how that relates? Like keeping it very simplified has been the approach that's helped me a ton. Is like, I used to want to be so minute on everything of positioning, glove, this, this, this. And it was like, it clouded in my mind with really what's important. And like one of my favorite quotes from Drew Hall um, is just like, the throw is simple. If you really see it from a simplified process and like you don't go too crazy on everything, like you'll see so many different pitchers do different things with their delivery, but like the process of how they get there is relatively similar. So I think just seeing it from a simplified like version of just like, hey, like all these guys are loading down the mound, they're rotating and the arm just needs to slot in at the last possible second, not do anything crazy to mess up. I think that is kind of the approach to take without overcomplicating the process. It's just the arms along for the ride, like keep the arm patient and then let everything else work. If you start there, then you can kind of branch off of it. I think it works a little bit easier. Yeah, I would say for, for coaches watching, um, just making sure that you know, like especially if you're coaching like a team or maybe at a facility, like 
definitely be more on the conservative side as far as like sharing information with the athletes but like you should be able to go down the list and like know what each guy's limiting factor is like understand his mechanics start to finish and be like okay there's five six seven things i don't like love about it but like what's the top limiting factor that if we just if we fix this if we address this like it's going to clean up everything else and like you should know what that answer is for each of the 15 or 20 guys on your pitching staff and that should be communicated to that guy from there it's like you can be a lot more careful and cautious about like actually making the changes but like at the very least like start off understanding like hey what are the issues that each of each guy has and then what what's like the most important issue for each of them and that's going to give you clarity in terms of there's so many moving parts it's like no like these six guys need to learn to like load their pelvis better these two guys it's like they don't know how to hinge and they're like they immediately just like lose tension like these three guys like it's a it's a muscling up arm action thing. like have some have some clarity in terms of what each guy on the staff's like issue is and then you can like be kind of a little bit more cautious depending on the time of year as far as like kind of tiptoeing your way into addressing these changes. Start with things that are a little bit less like internal cues. Is there a drill or constraint like long toss, two knee long toss, like something that isn't as likely to screw them up that you can try first, see if that works before you start like getting in their head and like making them really think about the problem. Um, and then just understanding like the time of your standpoint as well. Yeah, my biggest thing for coaches at any age, any level, I think you should throw. Like if you're a coach and you're coaching throwing, I think you should also be throwing just for the benefit of your athlete. If your arm if isn't anything. completely blown up in a million pieces, like you should on yeah. some level, like toss with your guys a few times a week or whatever, whatever that looks like for you and your time commitments. And yeah, how try to fix things within yourself. Yeah. And then that's going to make it easier for you to apply and relate to the things that your athletes are feeling. 100%. Well, I guys, I appreciate the time. Hopefully people got something out of this. Um, Definitely, you know, for anyone watching, feel free to interact with us on Twitter, uh, on Instagram. I know both of you are pretty active on both of those. So, um, again, we're responsive to DMs, like reach out to us. We're happy to answer any questions. But thanks, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you.